Luca Nets. We are out here, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. F- was originally supposed to be Breckenridge, but there were some issues with that. Yes, sir. But it's meant to be. Barely anybody's out here. We're out here in this cabin all alone. And like I was just talking before, if you guys are new to this, Luca has the most viewed podcast by far of all my podcasts, and for good reason, too. And I told you this in L.A. It is not uncommon for someone to tell me they watched that five, ten times. Right. Even, like, Dressy was like, do you know Dressy? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's like, that one was super interesting. I watched it, like, three or four times. God bless Dressy. You know, I wanted to do something before we started, but if you don't mind, I don't know if you're a religious person, and if you, if you mind, let me know, but I would like to, like, say a prayer. Let's say it. And uh, I'll kind of lead it from here. Dear God, thank you for letting me wake up today. Thank you for giving me vision, for giving me breath, for giving me the ability to hear, the ability to feel. Thank you for giving me life today. I tell you this every day and I'll say it again, but I'll be one of your greatest servants I will do more good in this world than the men and women before me. And you have my word. I just want you to look over my family, my friends. I want you to let everybody know that I love them, that I care about them, and that I wish them the best. I want, you know, the people who don't like me or wish bad on me, I want them to know that I wish nothing but happiness and joy in their life. I hope that they can accomplish everything that they want to accomplish. And I hope you can give them the clarity to see where things went wrong like you've given me the clarity to see where I've made my mistakes. I also want to say a prayer for everybody listening right now. I want them to know that I love them, that I believe in them. I want them to know that you love them and that you believe in them. And that if they're going through something tough right now or they're going through hardship, I want them to know that it's always darkest before the dawn. And God tests those he loves the most. I want them to know that they can achieve anything that they want in life, that there is greatness in them, that there is nothing they cannot do And if they don't believe in themselves, I want them to know that I believe in them and that you believe in them. I want you to give them the power to overcome any obstacle that comes into their life. I want you to give them the vision and the wisdom to accomplish and to see and to learn and to thrive I want them to know that they are loved and that anything they might be going through, I want them to know that they are not alone. That we all go through things and that we're in this together. No matter what our differences are, no matter where our differences lie, we are one. I just wanted to let you know, God, that I love you, I respect you, And I'm so grateful for everything that you've done in my life. And I want you to look over everybody that's watching this and everybody who's not watching this. And I would like you to make tomorrow a little bit better than the days before. I mean, amen. Amen. Wow. That that started off way differently than my first our first podcast. Yeah. We were talking about that the other day. You came in looking like a straight boss in that podcast with the Versace shades, <laughs> with the Von Dutch hat. <laughs> yeah. But a lot has changed since that first podcast. You've had a hell of a 2020. A hell of a 2020, Scotty. What's been the biggest change, you think? Finding God. And, you know, I had gone through my life not necessarily not believing in God, but I was always a man of science and logic and right. reason, Right. And a lot of those things kind of contradict what God's supposed to be. But always in my darkest moments, in my most feeble moments, something 
some sort of instinct would kick in and I would just pray to God. And every time that my back was against the wall or that I was in a corner and I prayed to God, somehow, some way, a miracle occurred. And for me, it does something to, you know, I had always told you and I told you this when we first met, like money doesn't necessarily make you happy. And I was trying to find like, what's gonna make me happy? What's gonna make me full, right? And I was always dependent on either women or friends or, or just some sort of affection somewhere else. And when I found God, I found some sort of wholeness in my soul, as weird as that sounds. And I, you know, a lot of things can try to disprove it, but I have, even, even if all the science disproves it, there's nothing wrong in believing in, in a higher power of just what it makes you feel inside and how complete and knowing that like I can go to bed and I don't need to have a woman next to me to feel like I'm not alone. And I don't feel like even if the world's against me, I know I'm still loved. And I know that, you know, this life that I'm living is just one small journey in my very long and fruitful journey that happens beyond this world. Yeah. And there's something about that that just, like, I used to be so depressed and so angry and so mad and so sad. And it was just really a struggle because, like, my story is one where it's like, man, people would kill to be in my position. And I felt lost and I felt hopeless. And when I found God, I, there was something in me where it's like, I will never be alone. And there's a joy and there's a happiness and there's a clarity and there's a sense of gratitude in finding God that was the best thing that's ever happened to me. My 2020 has been so difficult. And it's been a byproduct of pain and suffering and miracles and joy and happiness. And that joy and happiness resonates with what I found through these trials and tribulations that I've gone through this year. And, you know, I told myself I thought I was really sick. I thought, you know, we'll get into, you know, essentially what happened to me, but I shouldn't be here right now, you know? And for me, like, that's a byproduct of what I found and what this journey has been. And it's by far been, you know, I told myself, I said, man, even if I died this year, it's still the best year of my life because I found God. Wow. What, what do you think caused you to find God? Was there a specific moment that you realized you did? Yeah, so the first one was I thought I really fucked up. And I thought I was in a position where my whole life would have 360'd. Was this back in March? Yeah. Gotcha. And I thought that I was really sick and that my whole life and my whole dynamic, my whole shift would be completely different. And in that, I found that no money could save me. No person could save me. The only thing that could save me was figuring out a way to get to the next life. And in that, you know, I read the Bible, I read the Torah, and I read the Quran. And in all these books, I found, uh, I found the power of God, and I found what he could do for me. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people tend to turn to God when they're at their lowest or when their back's against the wall and there's no other way to go but to look up. You can't go right, you can't go left, you can't go back, you can't go forwards, you can only go up. And it was that struggle and that pain that led me to him. And I would do it all over again. Wow. Well, you mentioned how you were like, uh, you're a man of science and you didn't find God or anything. What's interesting is Eddie Bravo was talking about the other day. He goes, science is the new religion, if you think about it. Right. Because back in the day, 600 years ago, if you spoke out against any of the, the, you know, the agenda of any religion, you get chastised, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about, and sometimes you get killed, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And so now if you question anything about science, you get chastised, you get called an idiot. It's the same, it's the same thing, but we're just being fed different information, which kind of makes me question what is real. Right. And, you know, the science argument's an interesting one because if you take all of the, you know, let's say you take the great scientists of the world, the uh, Elon Musks, the Neil, uh, the Neil, uh, Neil Patrick Harris, Neil, <laughs> uh, the Neil uh, deGrasse or, or whoever it may be, you take the great scientists of the world and you put them in the room and you say, if you were to equate or put a number or a percentage on what we know about science, what would that be? And any good scientist will tell you, we probably as human beings know maybe 1% of science or 2% or 5% or 10% or 20% or I'll play devil's advocate and say 50%, right? But the fact of the matter is, is we don't know 100% of science and we honestly never will. And unless you know 100% and you understand science in its complete entirety, then my argument is you can never disprove God. Yeah right? We're finding parallel universes. We're finding so many interesting things, new developments. And like the science argument is a completely valid one. And I understand it until you put that into perspective. How can you disprove something that you don't know anything about? It's like four Sims characters and like Sims right. trying to prove the creator. I've always, I've never really stressed too hard about finding what the meaning of life is. Right. Because I'm pretty damn sure that we're just not capable of understanding it with this thing in here. So when people are saying it's like, um, well, I, I don't I don't know God. What do you say to the people who say I don't think God is real? Then I say do the math, right? You and I are going to have a conversation today, and you're going to notice a lot of my decisions are based on pros and cons, right? And so let's say that we understand 50% of science, right? And we don't understand the other 50%. And I'm, again, playing devil's advocate because there's no way we understand 50% of all science in the entire world, right? And then you look at the pros and cons, right? What are the cons of believing in God? Well, let me play devil's advocate again. I mean, I guess you could think, uh, I think probably the biggest one would be, uh, you can't say science for what I just said. And you probably could say, oh, I don't want to be a follower. I don't want to be sheep. Uh, and then, okay, I, I understand that. And then you lay the pros, right? The fullness of what it makes you feel inside the happiness and the gratitude and the perspective that God gives you, knowing that you are loved beyond yourself, the foundation that God and the morale of believing in God gives you. It increases your integrity. It helps you as a person, as a human being. The belief of God is so much more than just believing somebody is above us in the sky playing puppet master. The belief in God does so much more for you, for your mind, for your consciousness, for your soul than, than anything. And like I would say, just what are the pros and what are the cons? And then you notice like I've read every scripture or at least the main three. And there's also the aspect, you know, all of them are kind of different, but then you also have heaven and hell, right? And okay, if there's a 50% chance that God is real and there's a 50% chance that God is not, and then there's heaven and hell where in heaven you're going to spend the rest of your life in eternal bliss and eternity basically in, in love and light and beauty. And then hell, you're going to spend the rest of your eternity in, in burning flames. Well, then I ask you, even if there was a 1% chance that God was real, right? Are you going to take that? Like to me, it's like, am I going to risk not believing in something that I know nothing about and that I can't disprove or that I can't necessarily prove? Am I going to roll the dice and live my life? Because, you know, I understand God, God's not telling you to hurt people. When you believe in God, don't let anybody misconstrue you otherwise. God's a good thing. God, God preaches love and peace and happiness and and taking care of people and, and understanding that you have to leave an impact on this planet, on, this, on the earth and on the people and on the animals of it before you go. Like, there's nothing wrong about, I've read the books, like there's nothing there telling you to do bad things and, and it's just a good way to live your life. And 
to me, it's a pros and cons. I mean, I can list out the pros and I can list out maybe a couple cons and the pros will exceed 20 and then the cons will be like one, two or three. I think it comes down to that old saying where they're like, uh, I'd rather believe in God and then find out he isn't real than not believe in God and find out he is. What a great saying. Yeah. Because that's just the truth. You know, even if there was a 1% chance that he was real, even if you could do the math and do the science and prove it that way. You see, I'm, some things I don't believe, right? Like I don't believe Moses split the water in half and, you know, to this, you know I, I can't believe that. I'm a man of science still. I'm a man of logic. I'm a man of reasoning. But a lot of these things are allegories and tales to, that have underlying stories and meanings behind it. And you can't take them too literally. And a lot of the atheists or anti-God people will kind of reference those as hocus pocus, but you're looking at it too, too seriously, too logically. Sometimes some things have to be taken with a grain of salt. And, you know, when I'm saying believe in God, I'm not saying become a Christian or become a Muslim or become a Jew. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying believe that there is somebody above there, above you, watching you, watching your decisions, watching your actions, and tread with caution. Live your life helping people. Live your life loving people. Live your life in peace. Live your life trying to help the helpless. And that to me is what God is and what God wants me to do. And so I just weigh the pros and cons. I think it can only benefit your life and it can't do much to hurt it yeah. if you don't believe it. You know? There's general accountability for everybody. It is. If there was no God or no religion or anything, it, this would be an anarchy world that we're dealing with out here. It wouldn't be here. And so, I mean, again, pick and choose, make your decisions, read what you want, listen to people speak about it, and, and think of what's best for you. I want people watching and listening to take our conversation that we're going to have today and take from it what they please and choose what's best for them. And for me, God was best for me. Now, I've never read the Bible or any of the other two. It's fine. But I heard Jordan Peterson talk recently about it. wish I could dive deep into the details, but he described it beautifully about how the Bible was the first self-help book in the world. And, all, and like you were saying, the stories and the symbolism, the symbolism, is, the symbolism and the message is way more important than the literal story itself. Of course. And so of those three, which did you find most beneficial? And do you remember like a specific verse that just changed everything? Yeah, so for me, I resonated with the Quran most, right, which is Islam. And, you know, with Islam, it's kind of embodied what I knew my whole life. And I loved the Bible and I loved the Torah, but the fundamentals of Islam resonated with me the most. Like growing up, I did a lot of messed up things. I was in a bad position and I took the term by any means necessary literally and I hurt a lot of people I made a lot of money uh, finessing and scheming this is like when I'm 15 16 uh, to try to put you know money in my bank account to get out of the situation to help the situation that me and my family were in and that was all in pure money right like this is what we call in pure money and Every time that I've made any amount of impure money, it's been taken away from me tenfold, right? Whether, no, yeah. right? And it talks about pure money, and every time I've made pure money, it's just worked every single time, and I've reaped the benefits of it. And that's something that resonated with me a lot, you know, good and bad, and, and living my life as a servant of the people. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people take me seriously when I say this, but I genuinely believe my purpose on this planet is to help people. I am here not to live a life for myself. I am here to take my skills and my resources and my knowledge and my ability to change the world. I want a legacy, Scott. I don't want to live and just be another rich guy with Lambos and Ferraris and watches and houses and hot wives and whatever it is. I don't want that for me. I want, I want to inspire. I want to motivate. I want to be a role model. I want to die and I want people to look at that guy and be like, wow. That's who I want to be. That's somebody that lived his life to the fullest. 
That's somebody who helped people, who really changed the world, who impacted the landscape of this planet. And if more people followed my lead, then the world will continue to become better and better. I want more from my life than myself. I want to, I want to create a legacy. Definitely. And this is all inspired from finding God. See, I always knew that, but when I, when I found God, it just made it more apparent. Like, that's what they preach about, right? Like, the whole basis of Islam is, is the helping of other people. I mean, it's not, Islam isn't about you. It's about everyone else. You come second, they come first. And it's like a slow battle for me because, like, my whole life, it's always been me first. And so I'm in this transition where it's like, I need to... Everything that I have to do has to be for other people. Now, granted, does that mean I'll never have a Lamborghini? No, not necessarily, because I have to reward myself and I have to find pleasure in things that I do. But the majority of my life has to be for other people. Like, there's so many people who are in such terrible positions. And I'm not, when I say that, I'm not thinking about the people necessarily in America. I'm thinking about the kid in Syria getting bombed on. I'm thinking on that kid in Africa who has to walk eight miles for fresh water. Like how people don't deserve to live like that. And just the fact that I was born on American soil just gives me an edge above anybody else, you know? Oh, yeah. And I just want to level the playing field at the very least. I want to give young women an opportunity to achieve anything a man could. I want to give somebody in Africa to the ability to achieve anything anybody in America could. I want to give an African-American or a Latino or an Asian the same opportunity that any white male can, you know? I want it to be fair. I want it to be good. I want it to be equal. And I want my legacy to live. I don't, you know, Scott, me and you, whether we live 100 years or 1,000 years, you and I are both going to end up dead one day. And the only thing that's going to last is our accomplishments, our work, that now becomes our legacy. And I don't want to die when I die. I want to live forever. And I guess that's the selfish part in what I'm saying. But in that immortality that I'm striving for, I have to do great things. I have to strive for greatness and I have to achieve greatness. And I can't be like the next man. I can't think about myself. I can't prioritize my wants and my needs above, the else, above those of other people. I have to do what I know I can do. And I know I can do everything that I dream about. I go to bed dreaming about saving things, bro. I go to bed saying, I'm going to fix, one of my dreams is to fix Compton, to fix South Los Angeles. I'm going there first, and then I'm going to every single other ghetto in the country. And then I'm going to Africa, and then I'm going to Mexico, and then I'm going to Asia, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to keep And I'm not going to stop until I die, and I'm going to keep going. And if I can't achieve it, I'm going to die trying. Because I have to. You know? Yeah. It's bigger than us. You're so smart. I like to think that I'm smart. And unfortunately, people don't have the same capacity that you and I do. I've learned that. And as much as I never wanted to believe it, I've accepted it. Because I've been around enough people. And you and I... And a lot of our peers and a lot of the people watching this have a responsibility to not just think about themselves and to not just think about their families. Making money is easy. Me, you, and a bunch of other people have proved that. The money code is easy. I mean, granted, we're not billionaires, but we will be. And if we don't, it's because we didn't want to be. (laughs) You know? Yeah. We're going to, we have the power to, you know what I mean? You and I sit in the car and have so many conversations. Dude, you're, you're working on things that will make you $50 million a year, $100 million a year. It's easy. It's systems. It's systems. It's perseverance. It's strength. It's belief. And it's focus. We have our distractions, but we have to be better than our distractions. Yeah, know? that's for sure. You and I talked about something in the car, and that's the distraction of women. Right. You know, one thing that I'm really trying to lean on and to like train myself and to do and it's difficult because like just to be transparent and I have no problem saying this but I I really considered myself a sex addict like I really thought that was a huge problem of mine right and like 
like the ability to like just chasing a 30 second, a 20 second orgasm is jeopardizing everything that I'm talking about. I'm spending hours of my time during the day, during the week, conversing, manipulating just for a 20 second orgasm. And it's impeding on my ability to change the world. And one of my solutions to that is, I wanna find one girl, dude. Like I wanna find one girl and I wanna love her, I wanna appreciate her, I wanna respect her, and, and, and I just wanna focus on her and I wanna build with her, you know? And I think that's like, I think that's, you know, I can't go chasing for it, but like the girl problem has to stop, at least for me, because like it's such an instinctual need, right? Like I'm a man, right? you know, I'm a human, I'm an animal, that's what it is, you know, a smart animal, but we're animals. And it's like, that's why I told you like during that whole due process where I thought I was sick, I was celibate for like nine months. Unfortunately, I broke that. Oh, and what? I totally, yeah, I didn't no, you didn't me. tell me that part. Holy shit. Yeah, I totally regret it. I mean, granted, you know my situation so that you can see why. Yeah. And I, I was celibate for nine months. And I remember I, like I did the, and dude, in those nine months, I wasn't talking to girls. I wasn't conversing with girls. I wasn't doing anything. And I told you, I was like, dude, I had, that, that was my best nine months. I made more money in that stretch than I ever have, you know? Yeah. And, and it I, makes sense too. Yeah. Like, have you ever looked into sexual transmutation? No. Really? No. So Nikola Tesla did, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, all the big dogs, sexual transmutation. It's a think and grow rich. You use these processes they teach to transfer your sexual energy, which is the most powerful energy in the human body. Yep into anything you want. Wow. Henry Ford did it with automotive. Tesla did it with uh, his energy. That is uh, what you're saying right now, the greats did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so, it's so there. You know, part of me is like, I've always been a lover, right? Like I've always craved love. And like my future wife is out there somewhere. And you know, sex is an interesting thing. Kind of going off topic because I just thought of something. People have to understand the ramifications of sex, right? Sex not only affects you in your business life, right? By consuming your time, by consuming your energy, by draining your energy, right? But sex has a multitude of effects, not only on yourself, but on the other person. And like, one thing that I have to realize is if I want to be this man, if I want to be this role model, I can't just be that man and that role model for, for men. Like, I can't just be like the, the guy that guys look up to. Right. Who am I if I'm a guy and I'm having sex with four or five girls a month and I'm going and I'm sleeping around? Think about not only does that, you know, hurt my psyche, whether I understand it or not. Imagine all the women that I've hurt because I wanted a 20 second orgasm. All the hearts I've broken. And it's not fair to them. It's not fair that I put my sexual needs, my selfish needs, and then I go out there and I start hurting people. There also is a sense, you know, it's pretty interesting because in my celibacy, it's something I bragged about. I thought I was, I was proud of it. And you know, when girls would talk to me or somebody would hit me up, I would kindly say, hey, look, I'm celibate. And you know something, it gave me a power that I'd never felt before. Big time. You know? Oh yeah. Because guys are just known for being dirty dogs, like just sticking your fucking thing and like everywhere and like, oh, you have a fucking dirty this, dirty that. Like you're, you're you know, flip the script on them. See how many girls come to you. See what the quality of- They can the, smell it on they you. They can smell it on you. You smell see, those pheromones. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And, and see what type of quality girl comes your way. Yes. You know? They, it's like, Girls that the word got around, right? <laughs> the type of girl that was coming to me a year ago versus the type of girl that was coming to me when I was celibate, still getting curved, but it's a whole nother level. It's the <laughs> girl that I would actually, like girls that I would actually marry are now, like we're having intellectual conversations. We're not having like flirtatious conversations, but they want to get to know me, you know? And you're, and there's a certain, there's a certain strength in having that power, you know? And I guess, and I'm just saying that because like, I know some people will, will want to know what it will do for them 
besides that. And some people don't care about the ramifications that it will have on other people and don't care if a girl's heartbroken. You know, I, dude, I've, I've been with girls, Scott, and this is, it's going to break my heart and I'm not going to like get emotional about it, but it really hurts my heart, bro. I've been with girls that I slept with and they're broken when I just ghost them. And I know oh, yeah. it. And I hear about it. And like some people, we're not all the same people. We're all different. And like now this girl's suffering for six months for my 20 second orgasm. And, and like I'm just on this chase and on this prowl. And it's like there's so many more important things that need my attention. And I'm just like completely split sideways. And so like my thing is I, I met somebody He's one of my business partners. His name is Luke. And like, he was just so about like, you know, if I, if I could, if I could rewind everything, Scott, I would still be a virgin today. Oh yeah. I would have never pulled up Pornhub. I would have never pulled up X videos. I would have never done it. And I wish I wouldn't have, but I can't change the past. I'm not going to sit there and dwell and be like, oh man, I wish I wasn't, I was still a virgin. I wish I was this and that. But if you ask me now today, this very day, seeing the, what I see with other people, like I hope he doesn't get mad at me at this, but he lost his virginity to his wife, right? The best way. That's the love like none other, dude. Like, like their, their relationship, relationship and like, and, like I, can I can only imagine what that felt oh, like. Oh, they're never breaking up. That's like love, dude. That's like you're interconnected, you know? And I believe in energies and I believe in spirituality and I believe in interconnectedness at the end of the day dude we come from the same first organism that ever came right we just multiplied from a from a tadpole to a monkey to to what we are today we all come from the same you rewind everything we all come from the same root we're all connected in some shape way or form whether you like to believe it or not yeah it's really interesting how it's flipped didn't it yeah and with everything we're talking about that was like the standard I feel like in the 50s like yeah very respectful towards women. I mean, I guess in certain things, you know, they had their issues. But in terms of what I've seen, it was always like, you know, you you date the girl and because of religion, you're told to not have sex until uh, marriage. And then what, when you're talking, what it reminded me of, I feel like social media became the new religion because I noticed around 2010 is when I noticed a lot of people stopped going to church. Yep. I noticed a lot of people. And then here's the biggest thing. It's really interesting to me that so I'll, I'll read like comments on Instagram or, or like people, for example, Kanye. Kanye says, said a prayer just like you in Joe Rogan's podcast. People are calling him crazy. People think he's going psychotic, bipolar, all because he said a prayer. How interesting is that? But everything you see on social media is completely fine and praised. Like all the, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it seems like the devil came through and took over some, somewhere around the social media age. Yeah which is leading all these people and like someone we know, someone we know that's a bit younger. Uh, I remember we had like, we were all hanging out at this like mini party. And then he was like talking to this girl, all like laser focused, talking to this girl, talking to this girl, talking to this girl. And then he like kissed her and then uh, they like left. And the second they left, he comes up to me and goes, I'm never fucking talking to her ever again. I already deleted her off my Snapchat. And I told him, I'm like, you got to calm down with that because that perspective is going to lead you down a very dark path. Super dark path, dude. And, you know, it's a judgment-free zone here. If you want to go have sex with 10 guys tomorrow, Whoa. you go do it. Whoa. You know what I mean? If you want to go have sex with 10 girls, right. <laughs> but if you, I'm talking about the girls. If you want to go have sex with 10 girls tomorrow, go do it. Go do what makes you happy, but understand the ramifications of what you're doing. And the type of quality of women that you'll bring around. Like, do you, do you think a high quality, high, high quality girl is like, if you're looking for a super high quality girl, are you more likely to find it by maybe conversating with that girl again if she was really a good one? Do you think she's really just going to give it to you within an hour of knowing you? No, but the potential for her to be that possibly your fucking dream girl just went out the window when you said, I'm never talking to her again because she didn't have sex with me within an hour of knowing me. That is the worst mentality you can have. The worst. And the thing is, is what people don't understand is like, you're going to be with women and you're going to do your thing. But understand that 
the quality of girl that you want, you have to set the example. Like for me, I've always said, well, I want a good girl. I want a girl who doesn't sleep around. I want a girl who doesn't do this. Well, look at me. Screw the double standard. If I don't want a girl to do something, then I've got to not do it as well. Listen, she's not any different. If I'm going to go be a hoe, she can go be a hoe. And I don't want to be with a hoe. You attract who you are. Right. And so if I'm a hoe, then I'm going to go get a hoe. <laughs> hoe I, I want, right? You know what I mean? I want, so, I, want, I want somebody, I, want, I don't want somebody to pull up my past and say, you're this, you're that. I've, I deal with that all the time. And I regret it. I want somebody to look at me and me. That's a good man. Mm. And I want to be an example, not only for the men, but for the women. And how can I be an example for women if all I do is go around and hurt them all the time? That's not that. I would hate that somebody do that to my mom. And I've seen it. I've seen men hurt my mom and do all that. Ah, oh, not me, man. I, like, if I've got to be the, if I want something and I've got to be the example of what I want. There's no double standard here in everything, right? Like if I don't want people to lie to me, I can't be a liar. Right. If I don't want to be self, if I want to be selfless and I can't be selfish, you know, if I want to be a guy about the people, then you know what, Luca, you're not getting a watch today. You're a man about the people, but you got 12 watches. Who are you? I'm a total walking contradiction. I'm not who I think I am. I want to be who I think I am. You know, Drake said something, probably his best bar ever. He says, you know what's real when you are who you say you are. I want to be who I say I am. I'm tired of saying that I'm this and saying that I'm that and not being that person. I have to live in who I want to be. I've got to live it. I've got to breathe it. And even to this day, I'll still go do things that I don't want to do and that I shouldn't be doing. But, you know, life is about mastery. The person who excels in life or excels in their field is a master at life or a master in their field. Discipline is everything. Mm -hmm. People don't understand that. Discipline is everything. And hey, Luca, how do you get disciplined? It starts with anything. It starts with waking up at 6.30 in the morning, making your bed. I went to the extremes and started taking a cold shower every morning and freezing my balls off because I'm the most undisciplined man I've ever met. And I had to get disciplined. And I still do. And to me, discipline is the ultimate trait to anything you want to be in life. You want to be something, get disciplined. I have friends that look to me, Luca, help me do this. No, get disciplined. Because you know what I did became successful? successful? I became disciplined. You know what happened when I almost lost all my money in 2018, 2019? I lost discipline. I could be worth $20 million right now, Scott. You want to know why I'm not? Because I was not disciplined. Because I was so caught in my addictions and in my vices, in my chase for an orgasm and in my chase for a high, that I let all of these things compromise what I was supposed to do in life, my legacy, what the people, it's not about me. The whole world's counting on me, at least from my perspective. In my mind, the whole world's counting on me and I'm letting an orgasm and a high interfere with that because I lack discipline and there's shame on me. And that's what I had to do. I had to look in the mirror and I say, Luca, shame on you because you're obviously born with a gift. You've learned, you've tried, you've been doing this since you were 14 years old. And you're letting it all go to waste because you want to get high, because you want to relax, because you want to feel good. Who am I? I don't want to feel good. I want to feel good, but I don't. I, I, I want to, I need to be who I say I am. I'm a man of the people. A man of the people doesn't worry about his, how good he feels. Granted, there has to be a balance, but I'm a man of the people. I need to embody that. And that's the transition I'm on. And it's hard, dude. I'm not telling you that I'm perfect, that I woke up and I'm some 
jolly green giant that just knows everything, that practices everything that he preaches. If I took my advice, bro, if I took all my freaking advice, Scott, I'd be a billionaire somewhere. Yep, same here. You know what I mean? Yes. I've got the advice up the book, dude, but I lack discipline. Somebody who can't take his own advice doesn't have discipline. And we might have some discipline, but we don't have all of it. You're a smart dude, bro. Why are you not a billionaire? I'll tell you why. I like, you like discipline. You like That's discipline. funny because it's weird you bring this up. The last podcast I have brought up the exact same thing. And what the conclusion I came to uh, is similar. It's like I think laziness comes from inconsistencies. As long as you keep it consistent, it goes back to discipline. You got to hit that gym every day because how you do that, when you skip the gym, you're going to skip other things. And it goes back to the other old saying, old, old saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Start small. Yeah. You want to be successful. You want to live the life of your dreams for your family, for other people, whatever your motivation in life is. Start small. Wake up at 630 every morning. Have that pillar of structure. Make your bed. Your whole life will fall into line. But so many people listening to this will do it for one day, two days, three days, four days. They might even do a month. They might even do two. They might even do three. That's not discipline. You got to do it for the rest of your life. Yeah. I don't make my bed every morning. And I'm preaching to you saying that you do. You have to. My routine is still not perfect. I lack discipline. And that, to me, is the most important trait to be and to achieve anything that you want in life. The disciplined man, the most disciplined man in the room is the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. He's the most powerful. He's the alpha male. Yeah. The dog. He's the dog. I, I saw that. It literally developed on the podcast. So I woke up that morning. It was 7 or 10 degrees. My car is in the shop. I had to walk to the gym. Uh, maybe I'll just skip. Nope. I'm going to walk to the gym. So I walked to the gym. I had the workout wasn't the best, but I still made it. And then I came back and I was like, oh, I was supposed to film that podcast today. I don't know. Maybe I should just wait until I, nope, I'm filming the podcast today. And it, it's because I went to the gym. I walked to the gym even through that, even through that environment. So then I'm filming the podcast and on the podcast. I'm like, yeah, guys, sorry. I'm off these. I'm not on the bangs anymore. I'm kind of falling asleep. I think, uh, you know, I, I like to get it to an hour, but it's 45 minutes. I think I'm going to start. Re- you, no, you know what? We're going to an hour. And I probably wouldn't have gone to an hour, obviously, if I didn't start the podcast. And I probably wouldn't have started the podcast if I didn't go to the gym that day. And tr- I will say, trading stocks has gotten me way more discipline, especially with what Umar said. The most life-changing stock advice I've ever gotten from Umar. He says, you can't have structure in your trading life if you don't have structure in your regular life. And that's great advice. Yeah. Trading is all discipline. Trading there's so many things about trading that just embody the principles of life. Letting the trade come to you. Everything, dude. Because if you can be disciplined while trading, there's no reason why you're not a millionaire. Mm-hmm. There's no reason. Because it's a set of rules. A equals B. It's like I have a set of rules when I run my Facebook ads. If I don't get this by this, I turn it off. If it does this by this, I keep it on. Made me tens of millions of dollars. You know, gross revenue, obviously, but it's discipline. And, you know, trading is harder than that because trading is more of an emotional game. And a live emotional game. And you start gambling and then, you know, you see it. Trading is not about the emotional lows. People underestimate the emotional highs where you think you're just bossing. You know, some of the best traders that I've talked to, some of the big guys, the real hedge fund managers say, we don't look at profit and losses. We follow our rules. Oh, wow. We do what we do our Damn, do. That's a statement right there. It's a there. statement. Oh. And, I, and I'm telling you, you know, I've been blessed, at least in the finance world, I've been around the biggest of the big. I'm talking top 50 richest in the world, you know? Yeah. No, nah, we don't look at that. We do what we need to do. And when it's time to check, we check. But you start looking at the profit and losses, I start... Oh, man, I made $100,000 this week, $200,000 this week, $300,000 this week. I'm the man. I'm the thing. Bink. Yeah. I get cocky. Because people, you see, the hard, the easy part to understand is to, like, not get emotional with the losses, you know? You can all understand that. That's basic. You know what I mean? But the wins, dude, that's where you get carried away. And the best traders that I've seen turn off the P&L. Just do my do. 
Some people like something nah, doesn't mean doesn't mean that showing the PNL is wrong. It's not. You know what I mean? Show the PNL if that's what it need you need. But like the guys who are really making not ten, not twenty, not thirty million a year. I'm talking the guys that are really seeing make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred million. They're like, nope. Bam. Bang, bang, yeah, bang. and that's another thing I've noticed with those guys. They don't talk profits. They talk percentages if they do exactly. talk. Percentages matter way more. Way more. You can make $100,000 on a 10% play with a million. Of course. But you can, it, it's way different if you make that 100000 off a $1,000 play. I like that you said that because I've been, I've been showing people the big, the, the, the big gains. But you don't Fuck know. yeah, you have. I, I'm playing with big numbers. You know what I mean? No, yeah. I took, a, I took a small account. <laughs> what I did, you know what I did? Because I was going to open up a little, a, a little trading telegram. And I was, like, I was like, dang, dude, you're making a lot of money. But like, let's see if you can do this with like 10 Gs. You know? Yeah. And so I'll show you tomorrow morning, but in like two months I turned 10 G's into like 35. And I was like, okay, you know what you're doing now. Like you're not just fluking and like catching stuff. I mean, I believe in my process now. I've, I've made too much money to, to not, you know? And then just to put in perspective, I'm only saying this because you posted it. Mm -hmm. Luca out of nowhere posts uh, on, yeah, how many Robinhood accounts do you have? I have five. He has five Robinhood accounts in one. You did three hundred and forty-five thousand profit in the past four weeks. Yeah, that was pretty good. But I did a cooler one. I did a, I did two fifty in a day. <laughs> oh my god, two twenty-five in a day. And those that was at the Shopify calls. Shopify and Amazon calls. Shopify and Amazon channels. Calls. Yep. So did you literally just look back a year to see what happened around that time? Yeah, I mean, you got to go a little bit further than that. You got to look at five years. You got to kind of oh, see, and see the of, consistency, kind of trace it. And you know, subsequently enough, they were just at the bottom, mm -hmm. bottom of the channel. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? Yeah, I mean, it, and the, uh, it, it's funny how it all links back to structure because structure links back to the foundation. I've noticed with you know, kind of my strategy yep. with trading, and it's great. And every time I let my emotions get involved, it Crush. always goes wrong. And every time I execute based on structure, the more, and as I'm adding structure into my life, the structure's rubbing off on the trading, the structure's rubbing off at the gym, the structure's rubbing off everywhere. Structure is contagious, not only to yourself, but when people see you have structure, they wanna have structure. When the people hear you, especially you, you talk about structure, they wanna have structure. You know how many people are listening right now? Being like, fuck, I need to write this down. I got to get structured. Because I'd say, nine, I think it's safe to assume 99% of people don't have much structure in their life. 98. None. The only structure they have are the things they have to do. Or the things that, they, that make them feel good. Yeah, it's, it's doing the things that, make, that are uncomfortable. You have structure when you're hitting up a girl or when you're prowling on Instagram. Your structure is flawless. Yeah, you got, you're, you're working hella hard, too. You know, some people spend... I'm not going to say who because I don't. Okay, I'm going to call him out because he knows it's all in good fun. Right. Fucking Armin <laughs> Najad. He's so funny. Showed me his screen time one day, dude. 14 hours for the day, 12 and a half on Instagram. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't know that. That I've seen that dude like photos of like girls in my town in St. Louis that he's never met before. <laughs> you know what? People have to understand, you know, it's a very interesting thing. Sorry, Armin. <laughs> yeah, Armin's a funny guy. Like, oh, yeah, he's the best. He's so funny, dude. I saw him hit TikToks like I've never seen before. <laughs> he hit some crazy. I was like... <laughs> a lot of endless energy. I was working on the computer, and I just see the... I, I'm, like, I'm like, okay, yeah, you're hitting it. 10 minutes later, okay, you're hitting it. Same dance. 45 minutes later, okay, you're hitting it. An hour later, I'm like, yo, bro, you were like a master. Somebody get this kid a deal. Somebody put him in the sway house or the hype house. I almost made a call to, to one of the hype house kids. I was like, yo, bro, I got a new one for you. It's, it's crazy. Well, yeah, well I, I was talking about this with Jared. It's like he's like a prime example. Like a lot of people, I'm sure you get this message all the time. Luca, oh, my gosh, I'm such a fan. How can I provide value to you? If you got to ask that question, you probably don't have value to give. You know, which is crazy. I love that you brought this up, dude, because there's been people who have hit me up in Instagram and their lives are changed forever, like crushing it. But you want to know why? They came to me and said, yo, I'm a master at Photoshop. I will do all of your Photoshop for free. There it is. I said, bet. Let me see what you got. 
yo, I'm a master on gem pages. I will do all your gem pages for free, all of your funnels for free. Bet, let me see what you got. Yo, I'm a master website builder. I'm a master this, I'm a master that. Bet. Yo, where can I provide value? If you're asking where you can provide value, you obviously have no value. Because if not, you'd be approaching me with me with a proposition, with a value add. I've got a team already. I don't mind if you, if you want me to give you a shot. And the people that have excelled and have worked hard and have shown me that they can work hard, I've put in position. And everyone that I've ever put in position is in a better position today than before they met me. It's evident. Ask any of them. I put a million dollars up cash. Find me somebody who says they're in a worse position after they met me, after I took them under my wing. It doesn't exist. And okay, maybe I didn't, re I don't need to do much. I need to show you the blueprint because how I do my business is easy. It's like ridiculously easy. You know what I mean? I show you my blueprint and I put you in the right groups. You do the rest. You work hard. I just like hard workers. The hard workers that are good at something. If you're kind of lost and you're figuring it out, learn something. Learn how to write a good email. Learn how to copyright. Learn how to build a click funnel. Learn how to build a website. How about this? Learn how to conversate in general. Exactly. Provide something to me. Come to me with something, something that's difficult. Learn how to animate. Learn how to cut videos. I want to be your videographer for free for a month. If you do something and show me that, and then when, you, when you're in that position, don't be like, hey, man, hey, you know, I look up to you so much. Thanks, dude. Oh, yeah. And then when I give you a task, it takes like a week. Yeah. No, nah, dude. I just put my, I, I want to mention him. I put my young bull in position, Pranav. I love Pranav, dude. This kid came to me. I posted a little thing. Yo, I need a gem pages expert. He hit me up. I just took faith. I said, yeah, okay, bet. Gave him a task. Two hours done. Gave him another task. Two hours done. Gave him another task. Three hours done. I was like, dang, dude, you did all this for free? Fuck, like eight hours of work? Bet. Started paying him little, little bits amount of money, like a couple hundred bucks, thousand bucks, 500 bucks here, whatever it is. Boom, just done. Within, within minutes, within hours, I'm like, I'm like, you're a winner. Because that's what I would do. Some people are so, are yearning for a handout and yearning for somebody to come in and pick them off their feet and do something. No, dude, get off your lazy ass and get to work. Put in the work, dude. I can't teach that. I can't breed you that. So many, so many of my friends, yo, Luca, help me. Help yourself. Mm -hmm. I've inspired you. I've done my job. I've shown you that a kid can go from zero to hero, from nothing to something. Doing this. Learn. Go work a job. Save up. Go buy courses. Go do whatever you need to do. I'm not the only one. I'm not an anomaly. There's you. There's 100 other people. There's 10,000 other people. There's a million other people. Why are you always looking for me to do something for you? I'm not going to hold your hand. I'm not your mom. Get up and go do it. I've shown you. I'm a walking testament. I'm the American dream. We're the American dream, Scott. People are looking at us and they're, oh, do this, do that. No, get to work. It makes me so fed up. Get to work, dude. Start learning. Start providing value. People think I just got rich. No, I've been doing this since I was 14. I've been watching Stanford, Stanford speeches, Steve Schwartzman speak, all the big CEOs speak. Since I was 15 years old, I dropped out of high school to go work. I worked, I woke up at 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m., got on the, two, on the 7.20, 7, Classic. 7.20 to, to Santa Monica, which is an hour drive, which is an hour bus ride. People don't know, that 6 a.m. bus is packed, yep. standing, literally breaking my back, and... I'm a young kid and I just knew I'm going to go get it. Yep. What do you mean? Yo, oh, you know what I hate too, bro? I got, I'm not gonna, it's just, it's almost, it's almost like, dude, I, I got so many people, so many of my friends, yo, talking behind my back. Luca doesn't help us. Like, oh, what do man. you mean help you? <laughs> we grew up in the same spot. We went to the same school. We went to the same parties. We hung around the same people. Why am I where I'm at and you're not? I'll tell you why I worked harder than you, whether you want to hear it or not. It's the truth. That's the number one thing I got out of that book I told you about, Please But Not Satisfied. I remember highlighting it. Show me you care enough to try, and then I will help you. But most people won't, can't even get to the try part. They just want the give. give they just me, want the give. Give. give me something. 
What do you think about these uh, people posting their cash app? Like, hey, it's my birthday. Cash app screenshot. Cash app these nuts. <laughs> you fucking. Yeah, if only you could add a photo. Like, send a dollar. <laughs> send, send one dollar per nut. Two bucks. Dude, it's, it's ridiculous, man. There's so many easy way outs. People always want to take the easy way looking and praying and want and hoping the easy way just comes a stork comes and drops it under your chimney here's the easy way the easy the easy way is never sustainable i've made a million dollars the easy way a million dollars in my bank account the easy way it wasn't sustainable and i almost lost it all i made two million dollars actually the easy how'd you way. almost lose it all by the way I took a risk. I said, I've got this formula. We're printing money every time I'm doing it, so I'm working. I'm gonna get a big fat office in Los Angeles. I'm gonna hire people. I'm gonna incur this crazy amount of overhead and I'm gonna start taking risks. And it was crazy because every deal, literally the day that we got that office and I made that commitment, every single deal Every single play, I guess it's just like a godsend or like God was telling me, nope, Luca, it was easy before, but it's not easy now. You think you can just level up to the big boys? Well, watch, you're not a big boy yet. And just, bro, punishment after punishment, 300,000 inventory punished, 200,000 inventory punished. And then when even months that were breaking even, 25 grand a month in overhead, punish. I just was losing money like crazy. Just bought the house. Just paid five hundred thousand in taxes. Just, I was like, bro, I just had two million dollars, man. I got like two fifty. Oh my god! Whoa! And the end of it, I couldn't believe it. I was freaking in out. What, what time span? A year, bro. Jeez. I got, I got, and like, dude, like the comeback kid, bro. I was like, I was like Ali against the ropes. Oh, yeah. I said, left, right came back bro i came back and i'm richer than ever you know mm -hmm. i fucking came back bro i thought that was the end of me you see because you know what people don't understand about the drop shipping side being a good drop shipper doesn't make you a good entrepreneur and i took the step from drop shipper to entrepreneur and i failed i obviously wasn't the boss that i thought i was i wasn't the ceo that i thought i was I wasn't this, I wasn't who I thought I was. And so I had to double back. I had to learn. I bought like, out of that 250, I spent like 50 on courses, bro. I said, no. I said, it's not happening. Locked myself in the room on my bed. I love working on my bed. And I got to work. And I learned everything from everyone. What was the best course? Most impactful. There was one. I don't like the guy, so I don't want to give him the credit. But there was one. There was one that was significantly better than the rest. But him and I were talking, and he just seemed so cocky, he seemed so full of himself. So screw you, I'm not going to give you. What was like the topic? Like what kind, of course? Was Facebook it? ads. Facebook ads? Because I was never a Facebook ads master in the beginning. My break was influencers. Gotcha. You know, that's how I made my first two, three million dollars. $2 million. When you first started drop shipping, you were running Facebook ads though, right? No, when I was first running drop shipping, it was influencers. It was meme pages. It was, it was, it was influencer pages. It was, I was just, I was just a straight Damn. Out, outreach. I didn't learn Facebook ads until like really get good at them until like a year and a half ago. Oh, what? A year and a half ago though. I mean, I had a couple Facebook ads, but like I wasn't saucy with it. Dude, out of 10 products you give me, I turned two or three into a six-figure business. It's that good. You see, the issue with the issue with drop shipping is I realize it's not scalable how I wanted it to be. I thought I could have 50 stores, 100 stores, 200 stores, even if these stores printing making me five thousand dollars a month. You just make them, make them, make them, stack them. Right? That was my model. That was my ticket to 100 million dollars, 200 million dollars drop shipping. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. There's too many variables from the Facebook account to the processing 
to the back end, to the logistics, to the front end, to the maintenance, to making sure everything's working properly. Getting banned. It's, yeah, it's bans. PayPal. Chargebacks, PayPal holds. It's too much to do it that way. And, you know, I told you, and I've been saying a lot, a lot of people know this, of, you know, I'm making the transition, you know, I'm done drop shipping, right? Mm -hmm. And so with me, I'm done drop shipping because I think drop shipping is an awesome way to become rich and to take that step from I'm poor to I'm rich yeah. to I'm poor, I have money, mm -hmm. you know? And we've seen it so many times. So many times. But drop shipping is not going to make you $100 million. It won't make you wealthy. It won't give you real money. Yeah. And I'm at a point in my life where I need to make real money. I want to, you know, one of the most successful guys in the world, he's one of the most incredible medical minds in the planet and one of the most incredible entrepreneurs on the planet. I was sitting at dinner with him and his son, him and his, me and his son are really good friends. And he said, Luca, you can make 5 million a year. You can make 10 million a year. But wealth is not generated by how much you make a year. Real wealth is generated when somebody gives you a big fat check and you're rich forever. You can work, you can make $10 million a year and make and work 10 years and make $100 million. You can work three years and make 250, 500. Like on an exit? Like on an exit. Gotcha. Right. The money's made on the exit. Shout out Ring. Right. Shout out Ring, dude. And, I, and that was incredible, dude. I saw Yeah, it. that's right. You were connected to Ring. I was the seventh employee. Bro. Yeah. So seven employees. I'm the seventh. I'm the young jit in the crew, the young gunner. And they sell for a billion dollars. I've been in the car with Jamie. I helped Jamie move his house. He hit up all the employees. He was like, yo, I'm moving houses. Who wants to make an extra $200, $100? I said, me. I said, so when we're driving the U-Haul, I'm in the passenger with this guy. The guy exited. He probably walked away with 20% of the company, 200 million bucks. You know what I mean? Took something, you know, people looked at Ring very novel-like, right? Like, or at least you can take back to the Shark Tank thing. Like, they looked at it like a doorbell, yeah. right? Ring was never a doorbell. They were a security company mm -hmm. and they were a security system better than ADT, better than all the other security systems. Why? Because it was security before someone broke into your house. Mm -hmm. Everything else was after. Wow. You know? The front end. And they didn't, see the, they didn't see the image. And I saw that pretty early on. I was like, wait. I was like, why did the shark tank pass on this? Well, it, was a, it was an ugly looking product at the time, you know? But I saw them and I was like, Ah, I know what you're doing. Sold for a billion dollars. Amazon bought it, so it just fits into Amazon's business plan. Amazon wants every home to have a ring. They want you to, you know, to monitor their deliveries, to make sure their product experience and product integrity is good with, you know, the f one day shipping. Eventually, Amazon wants to be able to walk into your house and, yeah. you know, put the groceries in your thing. And Ring was a huge acquisition for them Definitely. to achieve that. Yeah, you know. And Ring was awesome, dude. Example, perfect example. I don't want to, you see, for me, Scott, I don't want to slave away working. I'm not as hard as a worker as I think I am, right? I'm a very, like, big picture guy. I'm a CEO. CEO's not there all day doing the work and, like, breaking his back and right. doing this. You know what I mean? That's what the COO does. That's what the CFO does. That's what all these other people below him does. A CEO's a visionary. I'm a visionary. Now, granted, I have to put in the work when to get the thing up and running, and I'm ready, and I'm willing to do it. But I don't want to sit here 20 years working, building companies, dealing with – I don't want to do that. Right. But I'm going to do that, right, in the beginning. But I want to do it 5, 10 years maximum, and I want to get somebody to give me a check that's going to give me all the leverage I need to do everything that we've spoken about, you know, in the last 20, 30 minutes. I can't change the world if I'm just Luca Nets as you know me now. I can do things, right? I can go, you know, go to the, the shelter and hand out food and I can, you know, donate some money, you know, pennies to what, you know what I mean? I, I can do things, yes, granted. And, you know, every drop counts. The ocean consists of a multitude of drops, right? Mm -hmm. And so drops are important. But I'm not a drop kind of guy. I'm a tsunami kind of guy. You know, and I rather, I rather put in the work 
And, you know, you can't change the system if you're not in a real position of power. The people who really control things are not gonna, even in the millions of protests, you can protest all you want. You can burn buildings down, you can do it all. No legislation was changed, a couple bills passed, whatever, that's not powerful. You know what's powerful? Me being having a couple hundred million dollars. Me picking the senator, backing a senator, running a campaign for him, and getting him in office. Me building plans and strategies to dictate how I think the world should look. Me being in the right rooms with the people that matter, with Bezos, with, with Mitch McConnell, with, with Trump, with Biden, to actually sit there and they listen to my opinion and I can probably sway them to make the decisions that I want them to make that I think are in the best interest of the people. I'm not gonna do that as I am now. And the, unfortunately, the way how they, how they standardize somebody's impact and voice in that world is by how much money you have. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't look at you, you have $10 million. Who are you? That's a vacation for some of them. That's a, that's a dividend. Right. You know what I mean? Part of a dividend. Yeah, for part of a dividend. You know what I mean? What, what, do you, what do you know what you're talking about? Oh, you're, the, you're that guy who did that? That was a great job. What do you have to say? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. I have to get there first. For me to achieve my dreams of changing the landscape, yes, I can do all, you know, the shelter and, you know, build the food packets and I can do that. But that's not going to change the world. That, cha that will change someone's world. That will change a couple people's world. That might change a thousand people's world or 10,000. I'm trying to change 10 million. I'm trying to change 100 million, you know? Now, when I, um, do you think there's a person in the past 100 years who has done something similar to what you're talking about um, in terms of the, the impact? And while you answer that, I'm just going to check these cameras real quick. I think that the approach in which I want to take not necessarily, right? You have the Bill Gates of the world, right? With medicine and education. And, you know, people don't understand, but even the Elon Musks and the Bezos of the world, what they're doing with space are changing everything, right? Because the final frontier, we need to be an interplanetary species. It's mandatory. It's inevitable. And the, that's the ultimate challenge and the ultimate goal because that excels the human race past one home base, you know? And so there's different factors. You know, the approaches that I want to take, I mean, Bill's done a great job, right? Because I love education. I think you can change people's lives through empowering them with, with how you approach, how you teach, and how people are kind of brought up in the environments they're in. So I like Bill and how he did there. My approach is a little bit different. Wait, Bill Gates did there? I don't know if Bill Gates did there. Oh, okay. I thought you said there. No, said education. That. Okay, I, I think you said that, and I heard there. No, 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 Never sorry. Mind. There, I think. What he did there. There. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. And my approach is different, right? Like, one thing that I'm a huge advocate for, a voice for the voiceless, right? And so that includes that kid in Syria. That includes that kid in Africa, which Bill Gates really hyper focuses on, right? It also means that the animals, I think they're the most abused out of them all. I think mean, it's such a corrupt, corrupt with what we do to dogs or cows and chickens. And, you know, I'm a hypocrite because I went vegan and, you know, now I'm back to eating, you know, meat in moderation, you know? And so I'm not helping there, but there's, there's a plethora of things. You know, one thing that really inspires me the most and probably one of the biggest problems I want to tackle is Improver impoverished parts of the country and of the world. Like, I think poverty is a huge thing that I want to fix. I know it's a huge thing that I want to fix. And I think education, as well as, you know, creating businesses and creating solutions, I kind of have a strategy on how I want to fix South LA. But again, my step one, I can't really take too much time. One thing that I hate what people do is people have like a vision, right? Or like they think like 20 years out and they think about it all the time, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, 
Like they're just daydreaming all day about something. No, I know what my, I take things chronologically, right? By steps. Step one for me, I can't do anything if I don't have hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. I can't. I can't do what I want to do. So before I start thinking of certain sectors or certain plans or exact strategies, I mean, I can daydream about them, you know, at night, you know, for, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes as I rest my head, you know what I mean? Right. But my strategy first, I know, has to be how do I get into the room? And this, our society and our hierarchy on how you get into the room and how power is assessed and measured is by how much fucking money do you have? Separation by elevation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's my step one. And if I can't do that, then I can't do what I'm saying. And if I fail, then when I'm 50, I'll start packing boxes of food and, you know, start saving animals from Yulin and start volunteering. That won't be the, you know, I'll, I'll do that anyway, but that's, that would be my, you know what I mean? But I, I, I don't want to help a thousand dogs. I don't want to help a thousand cows. I don't want to help a thousand kids. I, I want to help them all. I got to do that first by building something. I got to build a real company. I got to build something. That's him and him. Yo, Luca, this wants to come meet with you. Oh, yeah, come in. I know him. I heard of that. You talk to me about people. Yo, I might be working with this guy who did this, this guy who did that. It's, you know that's life-changing. You know that if you can pull that off, it's game over. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I need to be that guy. I want to be that guy. I am that guy. I just got to show you. And not to show you to prove myself because I've proven myself, right? I would I wanna, say so. You know what I mean? I want to show you to inspire. And inspiration has to be my fuel. Not proving myself. Proving yourself is a dark fuel. It's a good, it's a good one. Don't get me wrong. It gets you to the first spot. But you need a cleaner fuel once you're taking it to the next level. My fuel is inspiration and, and my desire to help. Yeah, that sounds egoless. Well, proving yourself has to do with straight ego. It's about ego. me. Huh. You got you to gotta hit everything in the root of things, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything has to be symbiotic with my message. I can't be, you know, one thing and, and be the other. You yeah. Know? It doesn't work like that. That's why I hear, like, the monks. Like, I hear the monks that do. Do you believe, like, some monks can levitate? and levitate items i hear the reason they can't do that like on camera or for other people is because that would include they have to be ego less to do it and to prove it to someone is ego and it won't allow them it's really interesting it's really interesting to know what's out there that we just don't know about because most cases people do things to prove themselves or to showcase it when a lot of amazing things come the most amazing things come from neither of those chakras, energies, everything. I believe in that wholeheartedly. I have a spiritual mentor. His name is Joffrey Hughes. And Joffrey is the most successful person that I know. And Joffrey is a middle-class man who lives in a nice neighborhood and, you know, the valley. And Joffrey's one of those guys that can do amazing things. And I've seen it. You know me, I'm not a kook, right? Like, I seem like I'm pretty level-headed, I hope. Mm -hmm. Dude, I, I was looking at this guy one time, and we were taking deep breaths. And he was talking. And, dude, I'm looking at him, and his whole face changes. And I see, like, a crown on his head, and his beard gets long. And I'm like, what? I blink, and it's still there. It's not like, you know, you're, like, staring at something too long, and you get in that daze, and things get misconstrued. Like, dude, I believe in that stuff. I believe the right people who have spent the right amount of time to master that side of life has the utmost potential to really do anything. And levi if levitation is one, levitation is one. I've never seen it, but I don't necessarily need to see things to believe it. I need to know it. And like, I would have never believed that I can look at somebody's face and their fate and their beard grow right before my eyes. I couldn't believe that. Jesus. You know, it was strange. Did it grow back or did it just that no, disappear? No, and then, and, then, and then like two minutes later, I'm like, I'm like actively, actively blinking and then I see, and then I'm like, he's back to normal. It just flips like a squirrel. So like, he was like that for two minutes? It felt like two minutes. Couldn't tell you, you know? But it's very interesting. You know, a lot of people look at success the wrong way. And I want to talk about this because I think it's important. 
Success cannot be defined by how much money you have or by the things that you have or by what you drive or what you wear or what's on your wrist. It's impossible, and I'll tell you why. I come to you. I put a gun to your head. You're wearing a Richard Millie. I take the Richard Millie off your wrist. It's now my Richard Millie. I go to the club, and now you see me. Am I successful? If, hmm. I go, if I go and commit mortgage fraud or credit card fraud, and now I got all this money, I got all this chains, all this Gucci, all this Louis, and now you see me, am I successful? If I go and I go hurt somebody or, or, or you know, do some sort of schemey, slimy thing or betray somebody and, you know, take something that's not necessarily mine and now I have this nice car and this nice house, are you now successful? Well, you have nice things. You have a chain. You have a beautiful watch. You have a beautiful home. You have hundreds of thousands of dollars but are you now successful? If, I, if I'm born in, in, you know, if I'm some sort of Saudi Arabian prince or some Albanese king or some Polish prince and I now have a billion dollars and I was born into it, am I now successful? Well, I have a billion dollars. Am I successful to you? Of course not. Success can't be measured. People have to stop looking at what people have and be like, oh yeah, he's successful. Oh, well, you don't know. He killed somebody. You don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, look at what they've done, not what they have. Right. Who is that person? As to me, I judge somebody based on the content of their character. I never, I never know. You can tell me the worst things about somebody. I make the assessment on what I think about somebody. Not as Instagram, not this, not that. I look at somebody and I say, okay, I know what type of person you are based on our interactions, right? And I determine somebody's success by who they are as a person how happy they are, what do they do for their family, for their friends, for the people around them, what's their motive, what's their purpose? Do they find joy every day? Are they in love, are they loving, are they caring? That to me is success. I told you on the drive here, I said, yo, if that guy at the ski lodge, if he's happy, if he goes to sleep with a smile on his face every day and he loves what he does, he's just as successful just as successful as any billionaire that I know. Any single one. And people have to stop looking at things and be like, oh yeah, he's successful. You know how many little scammers I know on Instagram? Yeah. All these little gurus. Like, dude, no. These guys hurt people for a living. They literally hurt people for a living. I know this one kid, little e-com guru. I, I would love to call him out, but I'm not here to do that. You know what I mean? Dude, this kid... One of my best friends growing up said, yo, man, do you know this kid? I see he follows you. Like, I paid him $500 for a pre-made store and a course, and it's been like two months, and I never got it. And this kid's got AP, his nice new house in the Hollywood Hills. Dude, you're hurting people. What are you doing? Everyone and then the outside looking in, oh, he's successful. No, you're <laughs> not successful. You're evil. You do harm to people. No shame. No respect. Shame on you. And you know who you are. You're listening to this. You know who you are. Shame on you, bro. Change what the heck you're doing. I bet multiple people just thought that, that you're talking to them because they know I'm talking to them. There's more than one out there. You know who I'm. You know, they they don't even, they know they know in their heart and their soul is getting rich worth putting hurting other people. I did it when I was 15. Dude, from 15 to 16, I had 30 grand cash, all blue hundreds. My mom couldn't believe it. What's this kid doing? Made has 30 grand, that's what I make in a year. What's this kid doing? Well, mom, I hurt people. What were you doing? Robbing, scheming, scamming. You mentioned um, like if you have a Richard Miller, someone brings a gun to you and, you and now he's wearing it and he's in the club, is he successful? A little bit off topic. Then you get an assault rifle pulled on you and they thought you had a bust down on and you luckily did not. Dude, that was such an amazing moment because I lived life like I was invincible. You know? I walked around like I couldn't be touched. I was walking around in broad daylight with $100,000 of shit on my wrists. Broad daylight, dude. Like, everything's sweet. Life isn't sweet. There's people from when I grew up there's people that like see what I see and they want it. And rather than learning and working hard and taking the steps and the time and the sacrifice to learn it, they took an easy way out. 
Let me put a gun to his face and take it from him. So you knew the guy? Yeah, I did. Damn. Seems like a lot of, uh, that was this year? Yeah, that was this year. See, a lot of, uh, a lot of your friends seem to, you've been having, like, there's been some schemy shit going down in a, in a lot of different ways. What do you think's causing that? Is it just your level? Like, the level you're getting to right now is getting higher and higher? Because was this happening before? No, it wasn't. But you want to know something? Some people were in your life as, le as opportunities to learn a lesson. Right? Some people are in your life as opportunities to learn a lesson. And it was God's time to, for me to learn these lessons. I learned amazing lessons, right? Like the shit that's happened recently with some of like pe people I consider my brothers, bro. One of the lessons I learned is never do business with your friends. Never. Friends and business should be different. If you guys do business and you become friends, it's a whole, totally different. different. Don't take somebody that you consider a best friend, a friend, and do business with them. Don't. Because then when you make decisions that is in your best, that makes sense from a business standpoint, it's going to be intertwined and become personal. And no amount of money is worth jeopardizing a friendship for. But unfortunately, I can feel that way, but somebody else can't. And I love my friends, dude. If you're one of my friends and we interact and like there's real love there, I will never intentionally do something to hurt you. You mean more to me than that, right? Like friends to me, like life is about love and happiness and joy. And in that whole sphere of what that is, friends and family are at the center of it. If you're my friend, I love you, dude. But money gets interesting. They have other goals. They have, they have people they want to prove to. They want to be proud. They want to feel good. And they think money will do that. But, you know, I said something. I said, you know, we'll go our different ways and, you know, things will happen. And, you know, things happen in people's life. And it's really important that you just learn the lesson from it and just not repeat it. And I've learned a lot of lessons with those interactions recently. And it's fine because... Now I know, and the next friends that I have, I won't make the same mistake. And some people are in your life as opportunities to learn lessons, and I learned my lesson. And this might not be the last time. And it hurts, and it doesn't feel good, but life is about lessons. It's evolution in its freshest moment, you know what I mean? And I'm fine with it, dude. And you know, at the end of the day, what comes back to somebody will come back to them. I got to leave it in God's hands. Because the second you get resentful and hold grudges and start being a little girl about things, it doesn't get you anywhere. I've got to change the world, Scott. There's people in my life who aren't aligned like that. There's very few people in my life that are. It's opened my eyes. I realized who I was around and what I was doing. Some people just don't share the same ambitions as me, and that's fine. Find peace in what you do. If it makes you happy, it makes you happy. For me, what, there's no better feeling than helping people, bro. I can buy myself a fucking $50,000 AP, $160,000 car, million-dollar house. It feels good. But, man, there's nothing like seeing the face of somebody who you've genuinely changed their life. I haven't cried in a long time. You know the most recent time I've cried? When my boy Pranav put that $10,000 day. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I said, I know. I said, okay, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not taking the credit for that because you worked hard. You put yourself in. I put you in the position, but you did all the work, so it's you. But I know that that might not, that, that might not have happened at that time if it wasn't for me. You know what I mean? would have happened regardless because the kids are such a hard worker. I felt so much joy in that. I said, man, that's my dog. That kid, his mom, and they're, they're, they're banking. Like, they took a risk on, like, his decisions. You know what I mean? Like, and it's paying off. And that shit made me feel so good. And it's like, I can't, I can't, I can't let other things and other 
external situations affect my legacy, I'm gonna be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm going to change the world. What's this situation and that situation? It bothers you so much you weren't supposed to be in my life anyway. Yeah. Stop crying about shit. Let's move on, settle our dues, keep it going. We either go separate ways or we don't, or we reconcile, whatever it may be. Whatever it is, dude. And it's not just with one friend, it's, with, it's been with a multitude, bro. It's like, it's like they're coming out of the rising. It's either I stop doing something with them, I stop doing something with them or for them, or, or something, something gets missed, whatever it may be. It's not just one person. It's been almost, it's been 80% of my fucking true friends are fucking out the window mm -hmm. this year. And that's fine. I wish them the best, bro. I want them to win. I love them. I love their families. I love, I love our memories together. Do well, bro. Do well. I'll see you at the top, but I want you to know something. I want you to ask yourself, because I'm a, I'm a forgiving dude. I'm a man of peace. We, we get it over with. We keep it moving. We keep it going. Just make sure you do great things, bro. Just, just don't fuck it off. Don't be selfish. Don't go to the designer store. Don't do this. Life's bigger than that. And like, we're on our separate ways. We're on our separate journeys. And like I prayed in the beginning of the podcast, I wish them nothing but the best. I want them to be well. I want them to succeed. I want them to have everything that they want in life. I want them to also have clarity and wisdom and to understand things, you know? It is what it is. So was, was that kid who posted the $10,000 day, that was someone you hired to be your intern, right? Yeah, dude. So I just hit some, I posted. On Instagram, Yeah, right? I was like, yo, I need somebody to do gem page. He said, I'll do it for you. How many months ago was that? Dude, the kid just, like I had probably like two months worth of work that the kid did it in a week. So like we met like maybe three months ago, but like two, one month in, I already fucking, we met up in Atlanta and he stayed with me for a month. I said, I liked you that much. And so his life, so it's interesting because his life started changing massively and will be forever changed. And then I saw in your story, there was another guy who tried to abuse the relation, use and abuse the relationship right away. And that guy's probably listening actually right now. I know he is. He little roach. He definitely is. And sorry, but that, that could have been his life, but he tried to use and abuse the relationship. And what it came down, he was selfish. You know what happened with that situation? I don't know the details. Because I bear some responsibility. But it also goes to another lesson. People don't know this about me, but I grew up without a dad, right? But my dad was very successful, extremely successful. And we had met when I was 18 for the first time. Was he successful in America? No, in Europe. Okay. And we had what met, was he doing? Uh, he was like a, a hedge fund manager. Oh, okay. And we met when I was 18 and he, when he said, Luca, one of the most important things I can tell you and teach you is patience. And this is my story. I had like 12 interns, right? I did like this little thing, this, I wanted to do like this little social media campaign. They all like put a hundred names in a sheet, did the engagement, did the post, did the contacts, everything. And they all were assigned a different store. And in that, in that store, I would say, yeah, you guys are working, and then I'm gonna pay all these people to do the posts, and you guys are gonna see what the results are. Some of them will be good, some of them will be bad, but out of these three stores, one of them is gonna really hit, and you guys are gonna see the power of influencer marketing. It was like a lesson, you know what I mean? You guys do the work, but you also Wait, so money. what work were they? They were just building the spreadsheets. I gave them a niche, and I said, look, find influencers that would work well in this niche. Oh, so you're not giving them the influencers? No, 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 what's no, no, no. The, What's the list of 100? A list of 100 names of influencers that they found that were related to the niche that I wanted them to, like if I had a product, oh, they found the names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, so let's say I had I, one of those things with CMOS. We were selling CMOS, right? And I said, yeah. look, find 100 people that you think would sell gotcha. CMOS well. Give me their contacts, their engagement percentage, their price. Damn. And I would just and I would just fucking go through and run That's through. That's a great it. exercise. And it's a great exercise. It was, turned out great. Unfortunately, I kind of dropped the ball. And I dropped the ball because something really extreme happened, right? Uh, part, a really extreme situation, which is the situation that I explained to you. Where it's like, dude, I... Like, you got to understand what I told you with the whole health situation. I was crippled, bro. Yeah. Like, dude, I was crippled. It was like for the first month, I like could barely breathe. Wait, right? is the, this intern stuff happening with the health situation? Yeah, so I did the intern stuff. Jesus. And then and then, and then then that whole health situation happens. Oh, I see. And so I dropped the ball and I never run the, I never run the, the promotions and they can never see the 
fruitions of their hard work. Yeah. Right? And I kept on making excuses, excuses, and now it's been almost like two, three months. And so they, one of the kids in there got really impatient, which is that, that one kid. And you just thought, like, okay, I'm just going to do this myself. Mm. And the thing is, is patience is key because I'm going to come back to those kids one day. I'm going to make it up to them. I'm not going to leave you. See, I'm a, I'm a man of respect, bro. I'm not going to have you do something for me and me promise you something and just leave you in the dust. I'm going to come back. You know what I mean? When the time is right. Time is coming up, you know? And this kid just thought he was fucking hot shit. This kid took Shopify stores that I ran took the list of people or made his own list, whatever, of his little group or segment, started going down the list, sending an email that I basically half constructed and said, hey, man, I run this site, this site, and this site, my sites, by the way. I run this site, this site, and this site. I would love to do the same thing for you. And this Dumbo hits up Harry Jowsey. I'm like, dog, that's my dog. I talk to this guy every day. He's like, yo, bro, I just got this email. It's signed his name at the end. Just got this email from this guy. I think he's using your shit. I said, no shit, Harry. He's using my shit. Send me the freaking email, and I go ballistic. And he'll actually like this part. If he, he's definitely watching. And then I'm like, dude, I'm going to eviscerate you, bro. I'm going to make an example out of you. I'm hot. See, I got a, I'm an emotional person. If, I'm either really angry or really happy. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, dude, I'm going to... I call my lawyer. I said, bro, draft this up. I don't care what it costs. I want to punish him. Because, like, dude, one thing I can't stand is, like, you taking advantage of me. And, like, I prayed on it. I meditated on it. He wrote up the agreement. The guy went out to go serve him. I spent like five grand on the lawsuit and like the fucking I was gonna do a criminal thing, everything. And the guy's trying to serve him and for like a week, dude, where he's posted in front of his house, he's like, yo, like this kid, I can't find this kid. Like, where is he? And I prayed on it. I said, Man. I was like, I don't this kid made a mistake. What the fuck am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, this is some chump who thought he could get wet up on me. I scared the living crap out of him already. He should be. If not, he doesn't know what's good for him. Got the guy trying to serve him. I'm paying this guy like 200 bucks every time he's going out to go serve him. I said, dude, this is doing me more harm than good at this point. I was like, bro, throw away the paperwork. Keep the template. Somebody's bound to do it again. Talon, you know, eventually I'm going to catch one because I'm going to send somebody out to serve you, but like, you better fucking hide in your room, lock the door, close the blinds. You think that's what he was doing? I don't know what he was doing, but we couldn't find him. We had his address. I knew his first and last name, and I knew where he was. Serving people is easy, you know? It's just legal, legal, legal thing. And so I wish, you know, if I would have taken a little more, if I would have took more deep breaths on it, I probably wouldn't have gotten that far. He made a mistake. He should have sent me an apology. He should have sent me two grand. Oh, sorry. He should have sent me some money. That's what I would have done. It's because you know something, bro? When if I was in his shoes, I probably might have done the same thing. It's a young kid, man. And like, I'm supposed to be a people of change. I'm supposed to help you from your situations. I'm not supposed to punish you and crucify you and put you on the, and just leave you and your family and everyone freaking out because I just served you with a lawsuit. It's not who I am to the core, but I got mad, dude. And I wanted to, you know, part of it is I, I got I to gotta be strong as well because I'm a man of peace. I'm a man of love and all these things. But it's like, yo, I want you to know you can't screw me can't don't think you can fuck me now people think they can fuck me and all the legal shit and all the fucking tough guy shit aside you can't fuck the common denominator i know where i'm going to be unless you plan on living in bumfuck nowhere in some rural town with 2000 people 3000 people you're not getting away from me you have to understand this I'm on a path towards greatness. You can't fuck me. You plan on going to Los Angeles? Give me 20 years. I'll own half of Los Angeles. That restaurant that you like, I own a piece of it. That club that you go to, I own a piece of it. That shoe store that you go to, I own a piece of it. I'm going to own a piece of everything. So make sure that when you fuck me, 
you're ready to feel that pain and feel that embarrassment because I'm not going to do it intentionally. It's just going to happen. Oh, I find out you're at my restaurant, done, out, now. Oh, I find out you're at my shoe store, okay, hey, 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 Diego, make sure you charge fucking... Give them the fakes. Give them... <laughs> shit, that's a good one. Give them... You know what I mean? Something like, I'm going to... I'm going to... I, bro, I believe in myself so much, Scott. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that every dream that I have, every aspiration that I have, I'm going to achieve. So make sure that when you fuck me, you're ready for that. You can't fuck me. You can only fuck yourself because you plan on being in those big rooms with those big dogs. Well, you better be prepared to look at me in my eyes <laughs> and you better make sure that you're not pitching something or saying something because I'll call you out right there on the spot. You want to go and sit with big investors and big VCs and you want to really take your life to the next level. Well, you better make sure to get, you better get used to my fucking face. You sound like Dice Andrew Clay. He goes, everyone thinks they can fuck over Dice. Dice does the fucking I do the fucking, bro, and I don't even want to fuck people because I'm not even, like, an evil guy, you know? I like that. But it's one of those things, dude, where it's, like, I'm, I'm going to be where I want to be, you know? And so just be prepared. And the thing is, is everybody knows this, bro. Like, and it's a blessing of mine, bro. I'm a money magnet. I'm in this, like, I have a reputation amongst a, a good amount of people where, so much opportunity comes my way. Dude, you're on my team, bro. I'm just sliding you back. Everyone knows this. Everyone knows this. Like if you're really close to me and you're like in my inner circle, 20, 30 people, and you have a skill that I know somebody out, bro, everyone's hitting me. Big guys are hitting me. Powerful people are hitting me. Do this, do that. I'm focusing on one business now right? Especially now, it's going, to be, it's going to be greater than ever for people because I stretched myself so thin and I've made a lot of money doing it. But like I told you, like I'm cutting all my businesses out. I'm probably going to lose, you know, a million to a million four in like profit that I'm taking by removing everything and taking this risk and focusing on one business, right? Dude, there's never been a better time to be my friend. You know how many, every day, <laughs> every day somebody's calling me, yo, can you do this guy's merch? Yo, can you do my ads? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Yeah, you're my friend. Boom. Yo, I, I, yo, Nick, you can do this. Bam. Nick, take care of it. Yo, Pranav, you can do this. This person, you know, what? do it. Done. 10 grand, 5 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, 50 grand, 60 grand. And dude, don't even take my word for it. Ask anyone. Ask anyone. Yo, I got this deal to do marketing for this thing. Yo, but like, you know, you know me, I'm not a great marketer, bro. Can you, can you do it? Can you, like, we'll go and we'll be partners. I'm like, yeah, bro, done. Well, now I'm wow. not that guy, but you know how many opportunities come that way? You sound very similar to that guy, Jeremy, I was talking to you about who runs like a quarter billion dollars of businesses and grows them. He basically does something similar, but it's a little more structured. He has like a team of like, I think he has 18 Right. And he's like three marketers, you know, two content creators, but he's like ventured and found the best of the best of the best, compiled this team. So when they get that business equity to grow it, he's like, hey, th here's the marketer, you know, here's the content, go, oh, here's that. It sounds similar to what you do. Done. Yeah, but it's not a business for me. You know yeah, what exactly. Like it is. Him, exactly. This, is just, this is just the opportunities come my way, dude. I've made the right amount of people, the right amount of money. I've done good by everyone. I've taken hits where I shouldn't have taken hits. I've taken beatings to the chest where it's like, dude, how the fuck did this kid take this 50 KL and we're still fucking 100 Gs up? I take them and they love me for it. Yo, you bring me a deal, I'll give you 50%. Unheard of. You don't get 50% for bringing me the deal and I do all the work, but I'm that guy. I don't care. I do good by people. And people know that, and it spreads. It spreads like wildfire. When you do good things, it just goes like this. I'd be surprised. Anybody watching this, let me know if I fucked you. I'd be real, like, from my core, I'm like, I like think right now, because this is actually like a pretty significant thing to say. Like, dude, I don't think I've ever really fucked somebody. And the people who think I fucked them are living in la la land. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you, there's two or three people that think I fucked them, but I didn't fuck them. They just think that. They fuck themselves. They fuck themselves, <laughs> but like, do they think that they're, they're not living in reality? Yeah. They're not living in the truth of the situation. Ask yourself the semantics. Did you do the work? Did you do this? Did you do that? Did you put up the money? No. So anything that I did was, was a great, I haven't made any poor business decisions. 
when it comes to where other people have fucked me. They just think, oh, because we're friends or things are personal that, oh, yo, you fucked me. No, dude, I didn't fuck you. What? Justification is the downfall of most people. I feel like I feel like in any circumstance, you can justify doing anything to anybody, but it doesn't make it right. I'm talking about in your own head. The head's a really tricky place. And you, you can lie to yourself. And you, you can, can lie make, to yourself. And you can make yourself believe. You know what I pride myself on? I think it's one of my greatest traits. I... I always play devil's advocate when i make a decision or somebody's mad at me or i do something i like i I remove myself from the situation and i look at luca and i look at him and i say yo damn want a lot of time i know i wish it didn't pop up this is great (laughs) (laughs) i remove myself from the situation and i say yo that what i do is wrong and then i go a step further I call people that I respect, people that are close to whatever situation I'm in. I say, yo, did what I do is wrong. I don't just call one person, I call another. Yo, I respect your opinion, my brother, that anything I do here was wrong. I explain to you the situation. I won't call one person, I won't call two, I'll call three. And I let the unanimous decision decide. I ask myself, I ask one person, I ask another, and I ask a third. I gotta get three out of one to see what I made the right decision. Every time that somebody accuses me of doing something and I break it down to three very smart, close people to the situations, I'm always four or three ahead. Always. Oh, so these people are close to the situation as well. Yeah, when I, well, like, like there's certain, like if it hits close to home, then I'll ask around. If, it, if it's just a straight business decision that doesn't have anything close to home, then I'll, then I'll ask people that are really good businessmen. And I'll say, look, did I make the good choice? I so, guess for me, that was strange. I thought I saw someone just looking in that window. Dude, chill. I freaked me the fuck that out. That freaked me like, out too. I think it was a reflection though. Dude, uh, chill, but for, for me to play devil's advocate to you playing devil's advocate with these people, what if the person that fucked you over was doing the same thing and they were just getting confirmation bias from the three people that they asked to? Repeat that for me one more time. I didn't understand it. So say there's a guy named John and he fucks you over and John thinks that you fucked him over and then you ask your three people who are close to it or you know your businessmen and the unanimous decision says that you didn't but then John goes and does the same thing and the unanimous decision says that you did. See what I'm saying? Because I feel like, like, uh, ta- like I know in my own experience, if I ask someone for that advice or ask someone, they're going to be biased towards me because I'm talking to them. Unless like, yeah, I understand. I understand. Unless it's like your lawyer who seems right. like he'll tell you what what the, yeah. what the deal is right. right away. Unless it's someone like that, which I'm sure they are. I'm just saying to play devil's advocate. Yeah, itself, of course. That justification is the downfall of most th- people. Yeah, and talent. I feel like that's how they justify by looking for those outward sources to tell them it was okay. Yeah, I love that. And so I answer your question, but I also, you mentioned Talon, and Talon's an amazing lawyer. I love you, Talon. I know you're watching. You're my all-star. Everything Talon has said has come to fruition. Every person he said not to be friends with, I'm not friends with, every single time. But that's a different point. There's his side, there's her side, and there's the truth. Right? When I ask people for something, I'm not asking for the answer that I want to hear. I'm going to give you the most unbiased assessment based on the facts that were relayed to me as possible because my objective by going through my counsel per se is not to hear what I want to hear. It's to see if I was right or if I was wrong because if I'm wrong, I need to make it right because I don't want to do wrong by people. I need to do right. And so if that other person goes and does the same and comes to a different conclusion, then I can only assume he's not following the same guidelines. Yeah. Because I will go in, I explain to you a situation. And what did I tell you? I also gave you the other person's side. I gave you where I might have made a bad personal decision, but I stand by my good business decision. Right? Like I will, I have to give you his perspective just as well as mine, his or hers perspective just as well as mine. And you got to tell me, you know what I mean? And you've got to, you've got to try to pick the pieces. And 
it's up to you. I got to trust the person that I'm telling to ask the right questions. That's why I can't just go to whoever, you know? So I can't just hit up 10 people and just start gossiping and doing all that. Now I got to go to people. Taking an Instagram poll. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that, you know? Even though, I, even though if I know I did, I would win it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Every time because, bro, and people closest to me know that. Like one of my business partners, ex-business partners, but I love him like a brother. Nick, he'll tell you, bro, I do that all the time. Like I will literally ask him, like, dude, did I make the right decision or the wrong? Like, Fuck no, bro. You made the right decision. Fuck out of here. You know what I mean? Like I always try. I always try, bro. It's important because the thing is, is if, if people know you for being biased or the other way, you lose credibility. You know what I mean? If yeah. I go to you, right, and I pitch something to you and I explain to you a situation and me and you get in an altercation, you know how I'm presenting it. You know what I'm saying? And it's important for me to... Now, with you, is a little bit different because you weren't in my counsel, right? I kind of pitched to you the situation per the confirmation that my counsel gave me. So I never went through the counsel process with you, right? So our situation is a little bit different. I told you what, was the, what the conclusion was, right. right? Four people, me, them, them, have all concluded the same thing. All people very close to the situation, friends with both you know, both parties told me, yo, look, the truth of the matter is you got fucked. You got really fucked, Luke, and I would have never let him fuck me like that. All right, man, I'll be the bigger man. I'm not going to, that's okay, you can fuck me, bro. I love you. I still love him. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm That makes sense. I think. Take the, the money, bro. There's, the money. there's one thing that you said that I, I totally see being like a meme from, from this interview. You go. <laughs> there's never been a better time than now to be my friend right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i could see that being a meme dude <laughs> nah true sh true shit i don't say that biasly bro i'm working on one project i've turned i've turned i've shut everything down and i'm turning bro every i shit you not scott you're gonna see me and you the next four days together i'll put them on speakerphone when an opportunity comes you'll count three three opportunities random opportunities will come my way watch it's insane a lot of influencer ones because people really know me for that mm-hmm but a bunch, bro. Yo, you want to do this? You want to partner on this store? You want to do this? Bro, oh, here, just to prove. Look at this one, bro. Ha! <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Okay, so check this out. What is this? Today. It says today, right? Yeah. Done with e-com. I feel you. Uh, whatever, whatever. What do you say? Do you have any supplier on deck for bed sheets? Right. I'm down to run a store with you. Linen bed sheets. Oh, okay. He's hitting me with a he's hitting me with I a got business you. deal. Okay, I thought he was just inquiring to know where the good bed sheets no, are. No, 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 no. He's like, he's like, I'm down to run a stair with you. Exit in one year. I'm ready to yeah. do this. That's just today. Yeah. It's, and I said, and I said, I can't right now. I have to pass my brother. I'm going to build one company to a billion dollars. I spread myself too thin for too long. It's time for me to take it to the next level. Smart. I had the same issue. Whatever, whatever. That's today. This guy's a beast. Yeah. Mike's like a beast, bro. Yeah, that's not some random no, no, no. DM. That's, that's no scrub, bro. That's somebody who really does multiple six figures a month on Facebook consistently. He really does it. You know what I'm saying? And he just wants to partner on a store with me. I can't do it. But maybe I should have texted him and said, yo, my friend Nick can do it. He's just as good as me. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Boom, opportunity for him. Or yo, Pranav can do it. This is like my little protege. Do it with him. He's a star. And you wouldn't make that recommendation if either of them fucked you? No, of course not. So you're completely sober, aren't you? Yeah, so I got back on the jewel, unfortunately, but we're about to kick that pretty soon. But, you know, me, I was somebody who smoked weed every day since I was 15, and I think that was probably one of my... Until when? Until a couple months ago, until that whole, until I thought I got sick. Oh, really? Wow. Yes, yeah, so when I got sick, I stopped the weed, I stopped the jewel, I went raw vegan, I went on like a 14-day fast, no food, I did... Eight, I did seven days and then I did nine days, but like I only ate like one day in the middle. I bet that was really good. Like the food when you ate it? It was really good, but dude, fasting brings out a demon. Yeah, they say, I remember, do you know Joshua Earp at all? Mm -mm. He goes, Scott, you have to fast with me. I'm telling you, the ancient, I forget, uh, the ancient, let's just say Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians believed it was the closest way you could find God. No. He's like, and he said at the end of his six-day fast, he's like, I was literally seeing God. Dude, it puts you in a bag. I'm 
telling you, Scotty, it puts you in a very powerful bag. My boy Santana, I've known Santana since I was 15. He went on a 41-day fast, no food. Oh, this my is, God. And he doesn't smoke weed, doesn't do anything anymore. This is somebody who's a hip-hop artist, right? This guy, smoke, you smoke weed all the time. You're around smokers all the time. Everybody is around smokes. I was like, bro, he inspired the heck out of me. You know how hard it is not to eat food for 41 what days? What do you do for 41 days? Just drink, drink juice. Oh, okay, so you're still, like, juicing? Yeah, you're juicing, but, dude, but you're not eating anything. That shit's so hard. Wouldn't that be, a, isn't that defined as, like, a cleanse? If you just juice? No, it's defined as a fast. You're okay. not consuming foods. Gotcha. Like, and you're not, like, consuming shakes or smoothies. It's not that. It's, like, literally water. Water juice. Like, it's, like, pressed juice. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, you're not, there's no solid. Like, a smoothie would be considered a solid. Like, if you're drinking smoothies, you're not fasting. You know what I mean? It's a solid. Your digestive system is working. I thought fasting is when you raise your metabolism with any anything that would raise your metabolism. Dude, all I know is you look up juice fast and like, <laughs> whatever it is, bro, that kid fasted for 41 fucking days, bro. <laughs> he drank fucking sugar cane juice and water and tea. Like, that's, that's, his, that's, <laughs> just try that, bro. It's like impossible. It's like discipline, right? You show that's all mental discipline. It's all a game of the mind. How many how many pounds did he lose, dude? This kid has a this kid was low key chubby, bro. He's a freaking eight. Yeah, pack. he's really. I saw him at the beach, dude. Yeah, he's good <laughs> now, but like, dude, now he's been working out every day, dude. The dude's great. Back to the source of the question because I went off of topic. What did you ask? We forgot. Um, it was some about fasting, right? Or no, it led to that. I go, why? Are you? Oh yeah, you're completely sober. Right. And so you were you drinking alcohol before this? No, I, I never drunk. I never drunk alcohol. But the thing is, is I was a huge stoner, smoking in the morning, smoking in the night. And, you know, a lot of people say, because I'm like a huge advocate to not smoke weed. I think smoking weed hinders your maximum potential. Like if you smoke every day, I will tell you that you are stopping or hindering your success. And when you do say that, the justifications come right out. I saw that on your oh, Twitter they, post. They love it. They love it. Well, you know, I just like to do it for it's like why at night. It helps me sleep. It helps with my anxiety. Helps this man. Unless you got something from the doctor saying you're clinically like have anxiety or all these things. Like I don't want to hear it. You know. And dude, I've never met anybody that has said, "Oh, I'm less productive now that I don't smoke weed." You see, weed is interesting because weed makes doing nothing okay. Weed yeah. makes you feel comfortable. Weed makes staring at the wall fun. Weed numbs the pain. And pain is a very powerful emotion. And it's something that you have to harness in your best interest. Pain being numbed isn't a solution. It's just prolonging the problem. But people say, Luca, you became a millionaire being a stoner. Yeah, I did. And you want to know something? I'd be worth 10 times as much if yes, I was. Yes, sir. So, okay, yeah, sure. You want to, you want to make a million dollars? You guys need to understand, a million dollars isn't shit. Like, dude, a million dollars, like, okay, it's great. But, like, what can I get with a million dollars? Like, I don't want to live in fucking bumfuck Tennessee in the middle of nowhere. I don't know. What's it do for you? It doesn't set you up for life. Okay, I made a couple million dollars being a stoner. Part of it was I got lucky. I'm not going to tell you that I didn't. Some of the things that I that happened and some of the way things worked out was partly due to luck. Now, obviously, preparation and opportunity meet. You know what I mean? Like, it's not necessarily luck, but I mean, think about the foundation of things. Like, like some of it is luck, dude. I'm not going to knock it. Some of the money that I've made, some of the bullets that I've dodged, was I got lucky. And dude, I would have been so much more wealthy, bro, if I wasn't smoking weed. It was my Achilles heel. Yeah. My, the people who didn't like me loved it. Well, I want you to know you're watching this. I'm an animal now. I'm a fucking animal. Me smoking weed was the best thing that I, that, that the people who didn't, like, the best thing that could have happened for the people who didn't like me for some reason. The best thing. Wow. You're a fucking stoner. <laughs> Good. They're just running laps around me. You run laps around people, dude. I don't think there's anybody who smokes weed that I can't run laps around. I hate to say, I mean, if you, if, obviously there's people who are stoners that are worth more money than me, right? Or do Snoop Dogg. I'm not comparing myself to you. You know what's interesting? People love to compare themselves to other people. Yeah. 
And I will tell you, when I was 15, I instilled this into my lifestyle and I stopped comparing myself to other people because that is a road you will go down that will never lead to happiness. If I consistently compare myself to somebody, there's always somebody who's gonna be better looking. There's always gonna be somebody with a better body. There's always gonna be somebody with a hotter girlfriend or more money and more cars and more boats. And if I'm constantly comparing myself to somebody, I will never achieve true happiness. It will never happen. I will get depressed and I will go down a road. And you know what the interesting thing is? We had an interview, right? And like a couple days or weeks after, like I had an influx of people, yo, I want to be you. I love, I love you. Like, yo, like you're such an inspiration. You're great. And that's fine. And like, yo, like I wish we could trade lives. I got one DM. Dude, I was so depressed. I tried killing myself three weeks after we had that interview. I tried hanging myself in my room. And I'm not, don't we're not going to dive into that too hard, but it's like, you can't compare yourself to people that you see from the outside. It's impossible. Oh, all the girls want to be like Kylie Jenner. You don't know what she goes through. You don't know how happy she is. Oh, I want to be like Luca Nets. No, you don't know what's going through my mind. You don't know what I'm thinking. I try to kill myself three weeks after that. You really want to be me? No, you've got to be the best version of yourself. That's the most important thing. You don't need to be like anybody else. You're awesome. Scott, you are awesome. You are better than, you are the best version of whatever you can be and you've got to work to be that. You know what I mean? And nobody is, there's nobody who's better than you. There's nobody that's worse than you. We're all on the level playing field. As long as we're kind and we do good by people and that we're loving and that we're preaching, you know, all the good things that life is really meant to be. Wanting to be somebody is, is, a, is a road that will never get you anywhere. It's like, a, it's like a fucking infinite road of just misery. Constantly want to be somebody. Some girl will always have a bigger butt or better tits or prettier face or nicer lips, but you're beautiful the way you are. You're, you're amazing the way you are. And if you don't like something, base that metric on what you think and what, what you want to be and what your dreams are going to be, not what you see on Instagram. Because like I said, I could rob somebody or scam somebody and I could sit there on Instagram, big boss Luca sitting with the million dollar house and the M5 and all these things like that. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know the pain that I feel sometimes. You don't know. You've got to work on being the best version of yourself. And some, sometimes people are just consistently like, it's, it's, it's a road down misery. You don't deserve that. And please, Catch yourself when it happens, when you're scrolling through Kylie's Instagram or any big baller entrepreneur or whoever it is you might look up to or consider your mentor. Look up to no man. Respect what they do and have them inspire you, but don't look up to anybody because when you look up to somebody, you want to be them. Except God. Except God. We look up to God. The only way to, right? We look up to God. It is true. But yeah. God is no man, no woman. Yeah. On my Tesla video, it, I saw that same thing. Like I got at least three comments of people saying, I want to kill myself with how many, after seeing how many people you're surrounded with. Like, holy fuck. Like they don't even know. I was sitting up, I haven't talked to some of these people in years. I was just asking everybody to be in that. They don't even know. So that's like a perfect example. They think I'm best friends with every person in that video. That's not true. That's not true. And what I was telling you in the parking lot, the biggest change is comparison. My, one of my friends gets a new apartment they have everyone over and right when I get there you, so I know it's not as nice as yours Scott but I mean look it has nice it has these nice windows someone gets a new car yeah like it, I'm, I'm excited but you know I know it's not as nice as yours but you know I'm like kind of get you cannot just diminish uh, what you've done because someone like that that'd be like because I could do the same thing I could I could Go to, like, I could meet someone with a Lambo or, like, Jared when he had his Lambo. I didn't go up to Jared and be like, yeah, I mean, I got an I-8, but obviously it's no Lambo. But he would look at me differently. You, right. you start to look at people differently. Kind of like I, I, I personally sort of start to get, I don't even know how to describe it because it's such a weird feeling that I'm not used to. And that's the biggest change since all this happened. So, so how do people change that? You know, it's just finding loving yourself dude and like understanding that everybody's on their own path and their own journey and their own destiny 
Okay, I might have all these millions of dollars now, but you could build a business when you're 30 and make 10 billion and then you'd be the richest guy in the fucking planet. We're 100, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like we're all on our own path and our own destiny and just focus on you and focus on your goals and your wants and your needs and don't let other people with stuff and things be your driving motivation to what you want to be in life and to what you want to do. No, think of, truly think about like, what your goals are, what your purpose is. It's great that you asked that because the answer is, is finding your purpose in life. Mm -hmm. What is your purpose? And with your purpose, there is no comparison because everyone's purpose is different. Though they might be, okay, we're going to all help people, whatever. Your purpose is your own. Right. Your purpose is unique to you. You have a purpose. I have a purpose. You're awesome. I'm awesome. He's awesome. She's awesome. We're all awesome. We're all great. And there's nothing that I'm doing that's any better than what you're doing. As long as you're trying. Now, I will say that person sitting there smoking the blunt, playing the video games. Yeah, you know what? I'll tell you, I'm doing stuff better than you, man. That's not, that's not a journey. That's a selfish journey. But you're doing what? If you're just sitting on the couch smoking weed, playing video games all day, eight hours a day, ten hours a day. Well, then I think that's an exception to what I'm saying because it's like, yo, as long as your journey is selfless, and is productive, then we're all on the same journey. But I feel like some, don't, don't justify what I'm saying to go sit and play video games and smoke weed and be like, oh, I'm on my journey, <laughs> my destiny. No, it's not the case, dude. You've got to, there's certain basic fundamentals that you've got to follow. But like you said, dude, like everyone's, I used to think, you know what I, you know what I do? I'd tell you what I do the most. And I can't sleep, I, I'm, I'm work in progress. I'm not perfect, right? I'm not. I don't follow everything that I'm saying to the T, but I'll be like, I'll see that. Uh, we were talking about that one kid, that 19-year-old who's crushing it, right? Thinking to myself, it's like, damn, he's making more money than when I was 19. Or, you know, I see, I see, you know, the, one of these kids, like, on the internet, and I'm like, damn, these kids are 20 in the Sway LA, like, claiming they're making five, 10 million a year. I was like, damn, that's more than what I made when I was 20. I was thinking that same thing about the seven-year-old boy opening the presents. And I wasn't making I was just 20 million. To, I was just to bring that up, because that that's, that's, that's what I ground myself with. I said, well, you know what, Luca? There's a fucking seven-year-old who's making 20 million a year opening presents online, so if you're playing the age game, you'll never win. Mm-mm. Because that kid's beat everyone. He beat Kylie. He beat everyone. He beat Jake. No matter who you mention, he's beat him. This kid's like the, this kid's going to fucking be 18 with yeah. $300 million. It's crazy. And they see Colonel Sanders. He didn't even start KFC until he was like 55, I think. Exactly. We're all on Eight own. failed businesses before that. We're all on our own journey, on our own paths, our own destiny. And as long as we stay focused, we stay disciplined, we work hard to, an, to a, a selfless, good bearing goal then the rest will happen time will come you'll feel pain you'll suffer you know in my prayer i said god god puts things in people's god tests people that he loves the most and you know a lot of people will be like oh it's not going my way my business is failing things not working you know life sucks my mom's sick something's happened to me you're being tested are you going to pass the test or are you going to fail the test? You see, with me, I used to feel so sorry for myself. And at one point, you know, when that whole sick thing happened, I felt so far, so, so sorry for myself. Scott, when I tell you I've been, I've been beat up, I've been robbed, I thought my life ended before my very eyes. I've, I've lost all my money. I've, I've been cheated on. I've I felt all the pain. I've been poor. I've been pissed in bottles. I've been homeless. I've, I've been in the police precinct. I've been in juvenile hall. I've, I've, uh, what else is there? I've, I've been betrayed by friends. I've been everything, bro. Everything, everything, everything. I've tried to kill myself. I've been addicted to hard, hard drugs like I just told you. I've been not disciplined. I've been a sex addict. I've, I've been all these things. It's what makes me me. I'm like a martyr, dude. If you feel like you're going through something, man, just pass it my way. Give it to me. Give me your pain. If you can't take it, I'll take it for you and just leave it to the side. If you're watching this and you're like, yo, I'm going through some shit right now. Give it to me, bro. I got, I got a back of steel, bro. You can't break this. So give it to me, bro. 
Give it to me. There's nothing more you can throw my way. The only thing that I feel like could crush me is the lo- losing my mother, bro. Anything else. Losing my mother and my brother and Tim. Like, that's the only things that, there's nothing else that can break me, bro. And then when those days happen, I still won't be broken. So if you're going through it and if you're feeling sorry for yourself and, and something, you have some sort of vice or some sort of battle that you're dealing with, throw it my way. Take a deep breath. Exhale what you're going through and fucking send it Luca Nets's way. I've just received it. <laughs> nah, nah send, send it my way, bro. This is a spiritual thing. Send it my way. I've just taken it for you. Done. That's no longer your problem. That pain is no longer yours. It's mine. Move on. Let's go. Let's keep it moving, bro. There's no, there's no time to feel sorry for ourselves and wander in our sorrows and sit and cry. I used to do that shit all the time, dude. Just sit and cry. And like, oh, shit sucks. We're poor. We're fucking, my mom's fucking, fucking beating our ass. Not because we did anything wrong, but because she's so fucking stressed because she don't know how to put food on the fucking table. How's she going to pay rent this month? Oh, I'm so sorry for myself. Luna. You fucking suck. Oh, she cheated on me. Oh. Fucking fuck out of here, bro. Send that shit my way, bro. I'm fucking made of steel, dog. Like, at this point, bro, like, I'm thinking of God. I'm thinking, like, bro, what else are you going to throw my way, bro? Really, like, realistically, bro, everything that I pointed out, what else the fuck are you going to throw my way? You going to throw fucking cancer my way? Bet I'll beat that shit too, bro. Come my way, bro. I'm ready. You know what I mean? Like, I'm fucking ready. Like, and if that shit beats me, then, okay, it beats me. On to the next journey. Death is not a door closing. It's a door opening. I'm ready. You know, take that shit, give it to me, bro. If you can't handle it, let me handle it for you. Your problem's not your problem anymore. Anybody watching this going through some shit, there's no more problems in your life. Clean slate, get to work, stop bitching. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got your problem now, it's on my chest. I fucking put the world on my shoulders, I don't give a fuck. I feel like thinking about that stuff all the time will bring more stuff like that around you all the time. All Universe the time. works mentally. It does, bro. Feeling sorry for yourself is the worst fucking thing you can do. Nah, man. You know, for me, my adversity made me who I am, Scott. Like, I, I don't think if I grew up a fucking sweet life that I would be here today. I don't. And not to, not to say that people who don't grow up in sweet lives, like, don't go and do great things. It's not the case, right? But, dude, you fucking, I take, I take somebody who's been through hell and back over somebody who's had a sweet life. If you ask me to put my money, to put my life on it. Yeah. Because, you know... The biggest thing that I've seen, I, know I have a lot of people, you know, that I grew up with that lived relatively sweet lives. And what happens with them is they tend to give up. It tends to, there's always like an escape plan. You know what I mean? Or there's, or there's no fuel burning. Like there's no like crazy motivation to be able to dig deep. There's like easy way outs always, you know? Or like, oh. I'll be fine or things that, no, dude, your adversity makes you who you are. Your trials and tribulations, your pain and suffering, the things that you're going through are not your disadvantages, they're your advantages. They're what's going to take you to where you want to be. When I was down bad, bro, when I was, didn't know how I was going to make money or how I was going to do it, and I found out about dropshipping and I figured all this is out and it wasn't working for me, you know what kept me going? My pain, bro, my adversity, what I went through. I can't give up. I have to keep going. I have to keep going, not for me, but for my mom, for my brother, for my family. I have to keep going. I have to be going because I've suffered enough. I'm done suffering. I got to figure, I got to get this money shit over with because everyone's fucking rich around me. Everybody. I see it all the time. We live in LA, bro. Every, you've never seen more expensive cars than in Los Angeles. How? I can do it. They can do it. I can do it too. I don't need you to walk my hand through this shit. I need to dig deep. I need to focus. I need to look at the fucking computer. I need to watch every YouTube video until my eyes fall out. I need to figure out some sort of good routine. When I'm not watching a YouTube video on the skill, I need to watch a YouTube video on on how to speak well or how to fucking do something, how to interact with people, how to be a social engineer. Half of success, 90% of success is EQ and 10% is IQ. So no, success, successful people aren't intellectually more advanced than the next they are harder workers and their emotional quotient is just higher, you know, and they yeah. practice that and they develop that. 
IQ is hard to develop. You know, unfortunately, that's something we're just born with. But emotional quotient is something you work towards, right? You can learn to develop your emotional quotient, right? And your emotional quotient is how I sit at a fucking meeting and get you to give me a $10 million check, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. that's that's my emotional quotient my emotional quotient is to sit there call an influencer i got no fucking sales and to say hey supreme patty i'm the guy who's gonna make you a fucking million dollars bud we ready or not obviously it didn't go as cool as that but that's your emotional quotient you know what i mean yo yo banker you're holding my fucking money you know what bastard i'm about to get my fucking new york lawyer at kelly and dryer he's going to fucking sick you like a dog i have no lawyer i have no Kelly and Dryer, and I have nobody. That's my emotional quotient. I'm going to bluff you into thinking I do. You know what I'm saying? That's how you get around in life. It's the finesse. Half of it is finesse. They'll all tell you that. Okay, IQ, you know, the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire, okay, maybe it's the IQ. Maybe there's a difference in IQ level, and, you know, maybe some people are just purely successful off their IQ. But we got 22 million millionaires in the United States. I say 20 million of them are just rich off of EQ, and I say maybe 2 million of them are rich because of their IQ. And I, and I think most people would agree with me on that. Mm -hmm. and this is not a business of, it's a business of working hard and maneuvering and understanding people and being a listener and being a leader. Not giving up. Not giving because up. Because it took you like 20 emails for the Supreme Patty. 30, bro. 30. A whole month. Bastard. <laughs> Sleeping on the floor, bro. Look at your fucking email. <laughs> <laughs> Should have hit me on the first one back, but it's cool. That's my brother, bro. Him and Austin are my fucking brothers. We keep it moving. You gotcha. Gotcha. And it's just like people just are so, so many excuses out there. Too many. What are we at? We're at a fucking long time. And we haven't even gotten into like Dude, it's so, so much many more. things. Besides not working with friends, what do you think the main lesson from that was? It's like doing the same thing and expecting different results. Sanity. I Every time I'm doing fucking business with friends, it's blowing the fuck up in my face like a catastrophe, bro. Mm -hmm. Like a catastrophe. And I'm over here picking up the pieces, trying to mend relationships. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not doing anything wrong, bro. I'm not. I'm doing good business. But good business, when working with friends, can hurt friendships. Because what might be a good business decision isn't a good friend decision. And in life, bro, I'm in a I'm, a, I'm in a dog mode, bro. My life is business, whether I'd like to accept it or not. I'm a businessman. And so, unfortunately, the first decision I'm going to make in a business decision is a business one. I'm not going to think about a personal one. I'm going to think about all the videos that I've watched, all the lessons that I've learned, all the people that I've heard speak, and I'm going to apply I'm not going to think like a friend. I'm going to think like a business partner. Things are not working out with us. Boom, I'm going to blow it up. You're not getting shit done. I'm going to blow up. That's what business, that's what happens in business. You set an expectation. You don't get it done. I'm going to blow up. But it's not right for me to blow up because you're my friend and you don't deserve that. But bro, this is business, dog. Do you know what I mean? What the fuck? You, you, you know what I mean? You think that... I owe you some sort of loyalty because we do something together. No, I don't. I'm doing the work. So if somebody else wants me to go do the work, I am not inclined to have you come join me if you don't provide value in the work. I'm sorry. That's what a businessman does. I make good business decisions. This is not free money, friend world. Friends will love free money. Oh, yeah. They love yes, it. They oh, do. we're friends. Free money. Man. I got a whole family I provide for, bro. My whole family is poor. I said it. They won't like to hear it. I don't care. It's up to me to provide. Their situations are different. I've got to provide for the whole fucking flock. All of them. So when I do business, I'm going to make the right business decision. Don't punish me for it. So let me ask you this question then. Fuck. I'm feeling it. Do you think the reason that you feel com so compelled to help your friends is because you feel so compelled to help your family? No, my friends are my family, right? And you know, there's one thing that while I was, it sucks to be rich and for everybody around you to be like not, you know? It, it, it's like, it's, you know, when you're winning with your friends, it's better than winning with not, without, right? So like, 
when I do business with my friend and it goes well. It's better than if a business goes well than if I'm solo. Yeah. Because now you're like two fucking dogs like in this <laughs> fucking like dog fucking business and you're fucking winning. And it's awesome. And you talk business and now you're not just talking personal shit. You're talking about life and fucking, you know, what we're going to do next. And it's a fucking awesome conversation. And it's just a great time. But it comes crashing down every time because business is not always sweet. You will have those awesome moments. But, dude, business is like this. It's always going to be like that. It might be like this and then like that. You know, it stables out and it plateaus, whatever it may be. But I feel like it's just not worth losing. A fr like the highs are not worth the lows. I'll tell you that much. It's not worth it. And like I'll go into business with somebody and I'll think like, nah, he like he'll like any possible situation that I'll try to run in my mind and process like, oh, that's going to go wrong. That's going to go wrong. I'll think like, oh, he'll never think that way. But dude, when money's involved, bro, people switch up. It changes everything. And I'm not just pointing fingers at them. I switch up too. You're putting like, like money's on the line here, bro. My mom needs that money. I'm buying my mom a house. I need, I need the fucking down payment. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that shit doesn't just come out of thin air. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, for me, it's money changes everything. And uh, that's the case. Mm -hmm. Money's not everything, but not having it is. Not having it is. And, and you know, losing it and the thought of, you know, expectations that you're going to make X amount or that you're going to do this when you, when that stuff gets away, dude, it just gets so sloppy. Money is, money is so powerful as much as it is. I don't know if you feel the same way. I feel way worse about an opportunity missed than, uh, lose, like say I lose money, not a big deal, but knowing I was like right on top of something that could have made me so much. That's what really not anymore so much, especially with the trading, but, uh, that was the most bothersome. Like, because when I had that net initial slope, I was more bothered by the fact that I missed adding in and missing all, making all this money than I could, like, I could make that money back. But it was like that opportunity missed. I don't know if you're that way or not. I mean, dude, I'm 100% that way. And that was honestly my Achilles heel, right? There's been key situations where I've turned down certain deals because I was quote unquote thought I was too busy. And those guys went to go make fucking 20, 30, 50, 100 million dollars. And I thought to myself, I am never going to turn down another opportunity again. And so as the opportunities roll in, I take them all. And now I've got 5% in each opportunity. And that might make me a decent amount of money. That might be like good. It might be good in most people's eyes. But to me, I want to change the world. And to change the world, I need somebody to give me a $500 million check, a billion dollar check, a $2 billion check. I'm not going to do that with 20 businesses. I'm not going to do that being an opportunist. It's not the case, bro. None of these guys, Jeff Bezos didn't do that. Elon didn't do that. None of the big CEOs, none of the big entrepreneurs had their hands in 10 different pots while they did it. And so every time an opportunity comes your way, if you pick it up, you've got to learn to turn them down and reap the consequences if it does well. Oh, well, it did. You know what I mean? I will, I will never be bitter about turning down an opportunity and finding out it does well afterwards. I will never. Because turning down the opportunity is always the best decision. Focus on one thing. Focus on one thing, something that you believe in, something that you're willing to risk it all for. And if you lose it all, get right back up and do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again until you can't any longer. Do it again until your fucking feet fall off, until your heart stops. Die trying. That's all you can do. That's a legacy in and of itself. I'd rather die trying, failing, and knowing that that's the guy who fucking tried. I mean, he fucking didn't do it, but damn, better than fucking being an opportunist. Fuck that. I'm the king opportunist, bro. Right. Living on your knees versus dying on your feet. Dude, I had like 28 stores at one point. Now, granted, like 
16, 17, 18 of them were influencer stores, and you understand how I run those. Those are very automatic. Yeah. But there's still too many stores, bro. Way too many. Still got eight that are doing ads. It's like, bro, it's bullshit. Were you, what were you doing for all those stores? Were you just doing the, like, what, what was your exact role in each of those for you to have 5%? Well, it's different. It's not 5%. It's mostly a lot, a lot of the times a lot more. Oh, so you weren't talking about the stores when you said 5%, 5%, 5%? Uh, no, it's like an analogy. analogy it's really okay. like 20, 30, 50, 40. 20. Oh, that makes that so much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not taking 5% of anything unless yeah, you've got like good. a real fucking... Like a 5% real... a ring if you right. go back, right? Yeah, I take, I take 5%. I mean, dude, I, I believe in people. Yeah. So if I believe in you, I take 5%. Pranav hits me with a move. You know, 5%. I just need you to do, I need you to do this for me. I take 5% for Pranav. Pranav works his ass off. And as long as I believe in the idea, if I don't believe in that idea, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to waste my time. Good room. You know what I mean? I try to take percentage in things where I know I can provide value, but I don't want to take too much where you get resentful too. Like if I'm doing the ads and doing the things, I want 50%. That's it. If I'm funding it or whatever, I want 50%. Unless you got revenue and shit to prove. Like I, I, I'm a, my dream, you know, where... After I get my check, I'm going to take that check and, you know, put it in the market, put it in a venture capitalist firm that I'm going to start, flip it, take that money, and then just build the empire, and then it's over. It's going to be so easy, you know? And then just help the world. And just once I develop that system, that funnel that's just printing $100, $200 million a year, I'm just going to, whoop, this goes to this project, this goes to that, this goes to Compton, this goes to Africa, this goes to Syria, this goes to Ulan for the dogs, this goes to that. We're just going to just fucking distribute and not distribute to other fucking distributors where they're going to take, where they pay themselves oh, yeah. $200,000 salaries for fucking doing the $50,000 a year job. No, no, no. I'm going to build it all in-house so I know where all the money's going. Mm -hmm. I'm going to really take my time and really put an effort. The rest is going to get done. That's all I can do, you know? Absolutely. That's the plan, my guy. That's the plan. That's quite a plan. You have laid out a lot of information in... Uh, Two hours and forty minutes. I think we gotta cut it. Unless you got I'm it. I'm thinking we cut it at this point, honestly. I wanna hit that jacuzzi. I wanna hit the jacuzzi. I got I don't know what time you woke up this morning. I woke up at Ooh, it's eleven. Wow. Yeah. Bro. I woke up at around Do you wanna hit the jacuzzi? Definitely wanna to. hit the jacuzzi. Right. We can watch that movie. Okay, watch the movie, go to bed at noon, tw uh, noon twelve. Yeah. Yeah. Spend twenty minutes in the jacuzzi, thirty minutes on the fucking T V. Because I, I woke up at three thirty your time. Ooh. Yeah. That's that's fucking sleep's just early. in that you you don't really need sleep, it's just all in the brain. It's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. You're you're great mind mindset. Very yeah. smart man, Scott. So anyway, this is definitely not the last podcast I can tell because I think we could go longer than this, but we're getting sketchy. We do I, these every year. I thought I thought we were gonna have issues with the battery, but I the batteries are fine now. Switched them out. I, we just don't have, we might not have enough memory on the memory card. Right. So, yeah, fuck. Dude, imagine we did this and we lost it all. We got it. We now. got it. We got it. All right. Well, later, people. If you've made it to the close to three hours, comment three hour gang in the comments below. Three hour gang, and I want to leave something. Uh, last piece of advice. Get up off your fucking ass and go get it. You are great. Greatness is in you. You got this. Do not underestimate yourself. Get up and go, bro. Get up and go. Fuck all the other bullshit. Get up and go, 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 go. Let's go. And don't compare yourself to anyone except the person you were yesterday. Yes, sir. All right. Ooh, I like that. That's the ender. That's the ender. Peace out.